The following program is rated TBMA for language and sexual situations. Viewer discretion is advised. Joanna Briley isn't your typical comedian. Since the 1990s, she's been one of the familiar faces we see every day as we begin our commute on the New York City subway or every late night on our way home from the club. On this episode of The Chris David Show, Joanna not only shares why her day job keeps her material fresh, but how she's using her craft to empower aspiring comedians. Joanna Briley is a comedian and 32-year veteran of the MTA, whose upcoming Black Women in Comedy Laugh Fest will feature dozens of Black women comedians. Here to give us more on her life, her comedy, and the Black Women in Comedy Laugh Fest, let's give a warm Chris David Show welcome to Miss Joanna Briley. Hey, thank you, thank you, Joanna, thank you. welcome. <laughs> Listen, I, I am so glad to have you. Thank and you. And I said, and I'm going to tell you something, because we talked off camera, but I'm going to tell you something here and now. I said, I have to be nice to you because even though I'm nice to everybody who comes on, but I said, I don't need you reporting my ass for jumping turnstiles. <laughs> That's you? I do, you turn around. Let me see the back of your head. <laughs> okay. Listen. Okay, look, all you got to do is look for the big light-skinned guy with dreadlocks. Yes. Wow. Yes, yes. Well, listen, there's a lot of them in New York City that are doing it. Matter of fact, they're not even jumping. They're going through the gate at this moment. Uh, yeah, people are... Um, since COVID, I really believe 2020 COVID um, emboldened people and people don't care. They feel like the government didn't care about me, so I don't care about your finances with the MTA. Um, and I don't say anything. I don't bother people. You know, I guess I still do my job, you know, as far as giving directions, but I don't challenge people um, with that. I don't. Yeah, I'm not trying to get my no. ass. Listen, <laughs> and, and, you, and, you're, and you're doing a job. That's yes. the other thing. You have a job to do. And like I said, I got to clap it up for that because 32 years, that's amazing. Yes. I've you seen some saying? shit. Yeah, I've you, seen some shit. We want to talk yeah. about that too. Yes. We're going to get into that. But I'm glad you were able, you know, to be here because, you know, Joanna, y'all, Joanna thought we were doing this in person. <laughs> and I'm yes, like, I nah, did. Uh, like, we're mm. doing Zoom. And, and, and when you when you did that that sigh of relief, I felt that all the way over here across the hustle. <laughs> Let me tell you. Yes. And somebody else, somebody else thought uh, I was interviewing Amber Riley. I said, no, Joanna Briley. Yes, yes, yes. Listen, I used to get Tawana Brawley. Remember her? Yes. <laughs> I used to work at uh, the National Humanophilia Foundation as a teen. And I used to mm -hmm. call Joanna Briley speaking. It's like Tawana Brawley. Because, you know, it just happened in the uh, late 80s. Um, right. And I was like, and my, my boss at the time thought it was funny. <laughs> I was like, no, it's not funny. See, this is why I tell y'all, y'all got to open up your ears. I tell y'all all the time, listen, open up your ears. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Wow. And, and, and listen, kids, that's something for you all to Google after the show. Exactly I'm not, right. Not yeah. About that, that was, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was a hell of a It was interesting. Thing. That was before, like, right now we have what we call social media where people just run with stories. Right. Um, but that one, there was no real, like, how do you know it's the truth kind mm. of thing. You had to either go with, we're going to rock with this or we not, you know, right. with the story. Um, right. So that was, that was wild. It, it, it was, that was intense. But I want to know about you though. We want to talk about okay. you today. Today you're there. <laughs> Thank How you. How did you start at MTA? Well, I grew up in Coney Island. Well, I, as a teen, I moved to Coney Shout Island. Shout out to Coney and, Island. Yes, CI, right. Sea Park. Yes, the surf, yes. but. Um, and I loved it. I thought Coney Island was great. But the, the elders in the building, um, one of the elders uh, in the building uh, in the 80s, they didn't have uniforms. So I didn't know that this person worked for the MTA, but he was telling all of us in the building, all the teens to take the test, take the test. Hey, take the city test. Take, you know, like the post office, um, a correction officer, whatever, uh, city jobs. And so I think I was like 18 when I took it. And um, they called me in 91. I was a word processor for an insurance company. And I was like, I don't want to be in the office. I hated getting up in the morning. I I was late every day. And because my friend was assistant manager, she never wrote me up. But I knew that I needed a job like the MTA where I could work the night shift. And as soon as I got into the MTA, I worked the night shift. 
So I took the test. It's an easy, you know, Q and A, uh, like fifty questions you answer and pass, which I got a ninety eight point seventy five, which I was very proud of. And um, uh, uh, they hired me three years later. I was twenty two um, when I started working for the MTA. I was twenty twenty one going on twenty two, or twenty two. Yeah, I was twenty two. Actually, twenty two. So I just told my age. Well, listen, my you age. don't look it though. I'm gonna tell you something. You don't look it at all. And well, I mean, you know what? It's because of the laughter aspect. Laughter keeps you young. It keeps you young, and um, also keto. I feel. Well, you didn't see me twenty uh, uh, since last year. I, I had put on a. It's a whole bunch of stuff why I put on weight, but I love carbs. <laughs> carbs are so good. Carbs um, are delicious. But, yeah, they are. And listen, so now, I got du donuts on my table right now. <laughs> delicious. Well, what I'm doing is I'm finding ways to still have the the joy of eating, but with quality foods and foods that don't spike my insulin and don't cause me to gain weight. So uh, when I want mac and cheese, I'll do cauliflower mac and cheese. That's you know amazing. I mean? so, yeah, so mm -hmm. and it's, it looks just as good. I yes. don't miss the, because um, when I did go off my plan, I immediately feel it. I start itching. I start getting what they call a histamine reaction. So, I mean, I was like, oh, I can't have that. I can't, if I want to endure the histamine, I'll eat it. But overall, uh, I've been pretty good. Um, since June of last year, I've lost about 50 pounds so far, and I'm nowhere near my goal weight because uh, it's slow. I've hit a stall, so I'm not even, like, stressing over it because I right. know as long as I stay the course, I'm going to be fine. One of the things that I did, too, was carnivore. Carnivore, I tried. It's an all-meat diet. Most, okay, so, okay, there's levels, too. So that sounds lion, amazing. It's called the lion's right there, diet, yeah. right? The lion's uh -huh. diet, where you just eat beef, water, right. and salt, right? And it's it's basically an elimination diet where you the it's weird because people don't the they believe what the um, the government has told us about diet and food and all of that. So when you start deep diving into what is really in our foods, you're like, oh shit! So the people I follow that do the carnivore. Um, white, black, everyone's doing it. To know that they have autoimmune issues that is resolved, blood pressure, uh, um, gout, uh, uh, kidney issue, all of that goes away when they get rid of everything and just consume meat. And some people are doing that for 10, 15 years, right? So, okay, fine, that's it. I'm like, oh, they're crazy. They, but I've studied this for two years before I even attempt it. So the base level of this plan is beef, butter, bacon, and eggs. Those are the only four things you can have any kind of way you want it. So that's one way to find out what is going on with your body because you're just eating these four things. They're supplying you the nutrients and the balance of what you need for your body. And then you'll be able to incorporate what you need to incorporate, whether you go back to vegetables or not, because now there's this whole movement about vegetables having anti-nutrients. Anti-nutrients. You know, yeah. I heard something about that. Yeah. And I, I, and I want us to get into that too, because now, because I was talking with somebody about this and I said, so, if the vegetables, when they're taking out, taken out of the root, no longer have the nutrients, then that means we need to start bending over into the grass like the animals and just start yeah. eating the vegetables that way. Right. That that's one way to look at it. Exactly. Because you know, it's it's the propaganda, right? Mm -hmm. That's basically what it is. The sad diets, uh, um, standard American diet was made to help the businesses, the agribusiness, the, the companies that process the food because they need us addicted to the food. So now we're going to need the medicine and the pharmaceutical. Everybody's connected. It's a circle. So when you start taking yourself out of that circle and start sustaining yourself based on your principles or what you um, uh, study or research, now you're the quack. Like, oh, don't listen to that person. Right now, this week, this week, a study came out saying debunking the keto diet, right? And it's like, because they're talking about cholesterol. Now, cholesterol, I found out, is a hormone. I didn't know that. I just thought it was some shit that clogged your arteries. But we need cholesterol, right? We need it. And they say, oh, don't consume eggs. 
has no 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 there's a there's a, a, a formula just like everything in our body our body knows how to regulate it so when you eat there's a there's a the way you eat will regulate your body right so you have to know how to eat so if you consume and processed foods uh, uh stuff with all that oil and chemicals and all the what's that gmo shit mm-hmm. yeah you're doing damage to your body so it's not gonna go well with whatever is in your body cholesterol like that's naturally supposed to be there so cholesterol might something might trigger cholesterol to go high or whatever so you don't know so the best way to find out is do an elimination diet which is you could do water fasting water fasting is another way to find out what is triggering your issues um i haven't heard anyone say on a water fast that their autoimmune issues resolved i haven't heard that i just know with the lion's diet and the carnivore diet everyone is talking about how this lady had uh what's that stuff on your legs eczema psoriasis oh, eczema ro- ro- white people stuff oh rosacea rosacea there you go. <laughs> it's all now, listen we're not going to just say because i've gotten it too but i am <laughs> okay. kind of you know you see i am kind of fair but but yeah i mean it's 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 common though white the thing people. is with black folks black folks get it but it doesn't show it show you up. know it doesn't show up and right, but hers something else. Right, right, right. She had her whole like from her waist down was just red, and she did the carn and she documented it, and her she it through carnivore she resolved her issue. She had that, and she had um psoriasis as well. So she cured herself through this diet, and she did her research as well. And there's a lot of carnivore coaches. Yeah, and I'm I will would be considered a ketovore, where I do keto. Most of it is carnivore, but I still add vegetables. I don't like I love broccoli. I love spinach. So those are the things that I eat. I try to get organic. And, and oh my goodness and greens and, and uh I, I have to have a salad every night or right. else okay. I'm a raging okay. bitch in the morning. So really? I have to have a salad every night. And, Do you and make what it I yourself? Is, or? Oh yeah, I make it myself. Yeah. Okay. And what I found is that when I don't have one, like I again, I said I'm a raging bitch, but at the same time, like I just feel off. Mm. I feel off. I feel heavy. I don't feel like my normal self. Are you at your desired thing. weight? Are you where you want to no. be? No. Okay. No. No. Okay. Nowhere okay. close. Okay. I mean, the thing is, too, what I have to remember is because I lift, mm-hmm. is that I'm not going to look the way I want because I have a lot of muscle mass but at the same okay. time you know we go to the doctor and they start their BMI you know that's shit. not for us though that our it's body not. as black people is uniquely different than right. others you know exactly. and so you have to so so that's what I've been doing I've been looking for doctors that understand who I am as a human mm-hmm. being as a black person as a black woman so if you're not of that mindset which is I ain't so fucking, important it's not because yeah. there's the doctors are still taught to this day that we as black people do not feel pain like other people listen Joanna we could go into a whole thing about <laughs> that because I got a whole study yes on, yes on that. But but wait, I gotta clap it up though for you for being at MTA for thirty two years. Like that's thank just, you, thank you, that's thank exemplary. you. That's exemplary. And well, and and, see, and you can retire soon, can't you? Yes, can't you yes. I two more years, two more years. I Look I can that. retire at okay. I turn. I'll be fifty five November eighteenth. I'm a Scorpio. What? I'm a good one. I'm a nice one. <laughs> you know, Listen, Scorpios get a bad rap, but I'm gonna talk I know, about. Right? I'm gonna talk about y'all a little later. I'm gonna talk yeah, about y'all a little later because right. uh, y'all y'all are good in my book. But, well, yes. but, but I, I just want to tell the kids something real quick. See, when you get started early, you can go out while you're still young. And, but look at how young yes. Joanna. Look, look at Joanna. Yes. Look how young yes. she is, and look how yes. moisturized she is. Yes, you yes. can go out when you're still young. And yes, yes. So and that's find something good that you can do that you like doing, and work that job, and and you can yes. be in your fifties and and you can go out. But right. let me go back a bit. Let's go back a little bit. When did you know you were funny? Uh, blah, 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 blah. I probably was 13 or 14. Okay. Uh, right. Are you a Brooklynite? Are you a Brooklynite? No, I'm not. Okay. Uh, I'm do not. you remember downtown Brooklyn, the Metropolitan Movie Theater at all? Did you? There was a movie That's theater. before I used to go down there. I, all I remember about downtown Brooklyn is no streetlights. Okay. 
Right. <laughs> Fulton Street. <laughs> I was like, damn, what, what part of downtown you was at? Um, but there was a movie theater called Metropolitan uh, Movie Theater. It's now the Tabernacle. Uh, Brooklyn okay. Tabernacle spot. Okay. But back then, Idi Amin. Okay. So we went to the movies to see, um, I don't know, I'm going to say a Bond movie or something. We went to see something, but then we snuck in and it was Idi Amin movie right it was the 80s late uh early 80s probably like 84 80, 80 something like that so we snuck in and and the scene we snuck in on he was in bed with two women right a white woman and a black woman Idi Amin but he was having sex on these burgundy satin sheets so I yell out oh snap sheets just like my mother yeah so everybody in the movie theater heard that. And my girlfriend hit me. She said, why did you say that? I said, sheets. S-H-E-E-T-S. Sheets. That and a sheet. I'm seeing the sheets. And I'm like, oh, my mother got sheets like that. So I was like, oh, snap. Sheets, just like my mother. And the whole audience laughed. I had no idea that I would do stand-up. I had no inclination, but my friends, like I was always cracking jokes. But that moment, when when I look back, I was like, I got a whole movie theater to laugh at something that I was just being like, hey, my mother got sheets like that. But I said sheets just like, and I guess the way I paused, I was like, oh, snap, sheets just like my mother. And, you know, everybody was like, holy shit, who says that? Right. And so I would say that, um spiritually right was a, a seed planted that i had no idea that to enjoy that feeling of all those i was more embarrassed because my friend like hit me like what you say that for mm -hmm. but to know comedy at that moment like oh shit that was funny and so i've always remembered that nuance of how to make a whole room laugh. And so that was the beginning of me saying, you know, hanging out with my friends or just, we were always laughing. And um, yeah, so that was one of the moments where I was like, oh, okay, so that's, this is comedy. This is comedy, okay. But I and still you know, didn't. It's so interesting that you say you discovered that at 13, because I did an interview with someone a while, a while back and he's, you have to see him. He's a uh, pole dancer and a pole dance instructor. But we were talking about shadow work. And okay. I said, you know, when you're, when, when you're a kid, you're your most authentic self as a child. That's when you know exactly who you are. Like when I was a kid, I knew I wanted to be a talk show host. Mm. And sure, I went to school and I, I did other things and I became a teacher and all that stuff. But I knew that I wanted to do this because I wow. like talking. Wow. But as a kid, like I was... And, and when I was, you know, eight, nine, 10 years old, that was the 90s. That was that was like the 90s, 2000s. That was okay. you know, all the talk shows were on TV. Right, 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 but, right. You know, you know when you're a kid exactly what it is you want to do. It's the <clears> adults <throat> who be like, oh, no, you can't do that. And no, right, no. Right, right. Well, you know. I can also share um, a pivotal moment when I turned to comedy. I was about eight years old because my dad, uh, my mom was going through a tumultuous divorce and I didn't know any better. I'm on the sidewalk playing Skelly with my cousin and my dad was an um, active dad in my life. And so whenever he popped up, I would just get in the car with him wherever he said to go because that's the arrangement him and my mom had that if, <clears throat> if he need Anyway, so this particular day in June of 78, 77, he pulled up and he was like, hey, you want to go to Connecticut with me? And I'm like, sure. I didn't know what the fuck Connecticut was. I thought it was an amusement park because my dad always took me somewhere fun, right? So I'm like, yeah, daddy, I'm going with you to Connecticut. And we get in the car and we're driving and we're driving and all I see is rock formations. And, and I'm looking and I'm like, wow, this is far. And mind you, he took me right off the street at Park Place in, in Franklin and I had no clothes. So the first thing he did was take me to Bradley's to the, the, the store to get clothes. And all I saw was white people. I was like, this is Mayberry. You know, because, you know, Mayberry, you remember just the town. Everything looked like a town, a small town vibe. And I just I just shut up because I didn't know what was happening. He didn't 
My dad wasn't a talker either. My dad was um, quiet until he drank. So he was a, a weekend alcoholic. So Friday when he got off work, he downed a thing of gin, and then he was the most talkative. However, my dad, you couldn't understand him because my dad got shot in the neck when I was born. So he said, I can ride. He sounded like a jazz musician. Uh, <laughs> and so, but he loved to talk when he was drunk. And um, so as I'm growing up and the sadness of being plucked off in the, I knew that time. Okay, I was like, June. All right, school is out. I'm hanging with my dad. Labor Day, I'm looking at the news and I see them prepping for Labor Day parade. I'm like, okay, so it's time to go back to New York. Time to go back to New York. He enrolled me in school in Connecticut. That's what I so, realized. So wait a minute. You're you're yeah. originally where are you from exactly? Are you I was from? born in I was born in I was born in Brooklyn. Okay. But my my dad, as I said, my mom was going through a divorce. So right. my dad, uh, she she asked my dad to take me for the summer only. Right? Only for the summer. And he decided he's gonna take keep me. But he didn't have a discussion with me. So as a being that that happened to me, I always advocated for parents to talk to their children. Talk to your children. You may, you may think we don't understand, but as a child, I would have understood that, oh, mom's going through stuff, whatever, whatever. So um, when I got to Connecticut, I was the only child in the house. And so I turned to Saturday Night Live, Second City Television, um, laughing, anything and everything that had something to do with laughter. Mad Magazine, Crack Magazine, I was doing, and so I believe that was my escape to, you know, because I cried at least probably for the first five to six weeks. I cried every night because I was like, why am I not going home? Why am I not going home? I loved my dad. It wasn't I didn't love him, but my mom had six kids, right? She had six, five other kids. I had siblings. So, so the fact that it wasn't explained to me, I thought I did something wrong that my mother didn't want me. You know what I mean? That's abandonment issues, right? So, and, and not understanding that comedy was the only thing that I watched that helped me heal a little part of myself or made me forget, which I thank God, you know, our stuff is sometimes always preordained. You don't know. I had to go through that to get to where I'm at right now. I appreciate it now, but I had to go through it. Um, to understand what comedy is and what it means to me. And I guess that's why I love it so much because I know what it does for people. I know what laughter does when people genuinely let go and feel the joy of laughing wholeheartedly. And so that's my gift to the world. And so that's why I just advocate for it. The women behind me in this picture, that was the first year of our festival. They're smiling because a lot of these women didn't know each other exist. They always thought it was can only be one of them in, in the comedy. And I created this festival to say, hey, it's a lot of us. It's all of us. So we don't have to be alone out here as we um, pursue this dream of ours. And so growing up in Connecticut, um, that's, that's where I guess you say the funny bone originally started. So I knew what comedy was, but I didn't know that I was going to be a comedian. I never said, oh, I want to do that. I want to get, when I get older. No, I didn't say it. I, when I moved to New York as a teen, everything I did was go to New York to the city, to the comedy club. I was like, I'm going to the comedy club. I wasn't old enough. Um, I would be in the Washington Square Park watching the comedians in the park. I would do anything and everything that I could to give me that fix of I want to laugh. So when I became of age, I went to the comedy club and just hung out, watched comedy, and laughed. And then I started dating this guy. Um, now, this is 91, 92. I'm in transit. I'm older. So everything's about comedy. I would go to all the Black urban comedy shows. I would go anything to do with comedy. And so this guy I was dating. His name is Andre. Was Andre. He passed away. But we went to so many comedy shows. He was like, I really love comedy. I said, yeah, I do. And then he goes, we were at a show. I can't. I, I wish I could remember who, where we were. But he's like, you know, you're funnier than that guy on stage. And I was like, I am? He's like, yeah. He said, you could do that. And I was like, I can? He's like, yeah. And so the Learning Annex is was a, a local paper where you could do 
classes. So he came to my apartment and he circled how to be a stand-up comedian. And I took the course and the rest, as they say, is history. So that was 1996. And I started doing stand-up. And God God bless him and, and yes. shout out to him. That's amazing. Yes. yes. So he, um, we broke up short, shortly after. <laughs> because you know what? he Anyway, his, in his story, he was the type that he would motivate, empower, and encourage women in his life to do great things. And then he would bounce. That's what he said is his lot in life. And so I that had was to, his that was his purpose. Right, right. And he also said, you know, you're so smart. You should go back to school. You should go to school. So I went to college. I got a degree. Um, mm -hmm. so uh um and what we worked for transit, right? And so after like 20 years, 15 years of me doing comedy, I was searching for him because I wanted him to see my progress. Like, hey, you need to come to the show and see, you know, I'm still doing it. But yeah, we, we got a chance to talk before he passed away. Um, so yeah, it was just like that to me was like one of the biggest like joys of my life that I got to go on stage. I still was shy, um, as I was doing it. So that's another reason why I created the festival because I didn't want women on this journey feeling alone because I did, I didn't know how to communicate to the other sister that I saw, a veteran or the woman that was older than me in the game, how do I get her to be my friend and help me, you know, be a mentor or help, you know, with the buddy system. So I, cre I created something where it's like, we're going to, um, I'm going to let you know that you could come to me. We can all support each other. So that's what you see behind us. And, and, and that's picture. what it's all, listen, that's what it's all about. But I just got to, I have to do this you, because you're from Brooklyn. I got to yes. shout out Brooklyn. Yes. Okay. And I need Brooklyn to stand up. And, and, and matter of fact, I, Brooklyn just doesn't ever need to sit down. Because <laughs> I just, I have you Brooklyn folks on all the time. I love yes. having Brooklyn yes. folks on. And, and the other thing is I got to shout, and you're a Scorpio. Yes. 1118. 1118. I think that's Whoopi Goldberg's birthday also. I no, think it is. No, she's the 13th. She's the 13th. She's okay. The 13th. Yeah, yeah, I but know you know, that. Scorpios get a bad rap. But the thing is, y'all are naturally funny. And I adore Scorpios. I, my grandmother I, was a Scorpio. Wow. My mother is like kind of on the cusp. Wow. My mother is. A uh, Libra my or Libra Scorpio? My mother's a Libra Scorpio. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. My homegirl, Sydney, she's 11, 10, I think. And okay. then I have a Scorpio moon. I'm a Capricorn. Wow. You do but charts? I have a Scorpio moon. You do charts? I, I dabble, but I okay. just, you know, I don't know. Every it, it gets a little little tricky because you have to know your exact birth take birth time right. and you have to know mm -hmm. the place and you know I, I could do a person's chart but if they don't know their birth time then I mean you know yeah I'm I was born one oh nine at night and that's why my mom said she used to have to spank me as a kid because I never went to sleep I would be up watching the bouncing ball on Channel Thirteen <laughs> I, yeah I did I was like watching any and everything because I just. It was something about being up at night that just brought me but joy. That's the Scorpio thing, though, oh, because okay. all of those people I've named be up late. Like my grandmother, I used to be up late with her till she would come <laughs> in from bingo. Let me tell you, she'd come in from bingo around like one in the morning, and I'd be up late with her watching TV, watching stuff I had no business watching, <laughs> and drinking coffee with her. She'd be up till what? like six in the morning. Then she'd go to sleep, then wake up. And make coffee again and be frying bacon. Wow. The lady wow. was like this tall and like wow. all of like 80 pounds. Like seriously. Wow. But That's she was cool. a Scorpio and I, I used to be up with her. And, wow. and like I so said, maybe I'm you're a Scorpio right. yeah. moon. Yes. It, and I'm a Capricorn. So like I'm okay. the whole devil. But I'm fun. Like I'm a fun but, guy. I'm a fun adventure. I do hold grudges sometimes. And they know <laughs> that I do. But I, and, 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 and my friends, when I was growing up, my friends Dante and Khalil, they were both Scorpio. Oh, like, wow. I think they were the same. So day. you were surrounded. You were surrounded. And we used to stay in some, Joanna, listen, we used to stay in some comedic trouble. So, but here's the thing, though. We have a lot of fun on my show. And I want to have fun with you because, you know, you're, you're the fu one funny sister. Yes, you are amen. the one funny sister. Okay. okay. I want to know, though, tell me about the wildest date that you've ever been on. The wildest date? Yes, with a guy. Wildest date. Hmm. Well, I don't know. If, I don't know. Fucking in the car, people do that. Like that's not wild to me, you know. Because it's like, I don't know. I don't think it was wild. But 
I'm gonna tell you something I did that I feel like was crazy. Okay. I I meet customers all the time, right? In mm -hmm. in in the job. And right. I had this ritual or this rule that I won't fuck them, right? I won't yeah, fuck. That's what it was. I won't fuck them till I know I'm leaving that location. Because if you are familiar with the, the system, you know, you may not see that person again. Mm -hmm. but a lot of times you will see the same person at the station every day because we pick locations based on convenience, time, and whatever. So this particular station, this was way back when uh, um, Metro Car just started. So it was like 92, 93, something like that. So I'm at Essex Street, Essex Street on the J. And this guy used to come, he flirting, ah, so I'm doing all, I knew I was leaving. Just say, just say I was leaving uh, uh, Sunday, right? So this previous weekend, he came over, he cooked me dinner, we fucked, he cooked me dinner, all right? In my Park Slope apartment, I had a fireplace. Like, we did the whole romantic shit. It was amazing. I got a picture of him, right? Washing dishes. I snapped it while he was, you know, washing the dishes. I'm like, oh, this is nice. And so that Sunday, I was supposed to leave and never go back to that location. I was going to still see him once I left. I get to work, they cancel. And it's like, oh, you got to stay here a couple of more weeks. And so he's all googly eyeing me. And I'm like, I'm a thot. I don't want nobody to know I was fucking you. Get the fuck out of here. So I was like, scram, scram. You know, like you telling on me, like, you know, he's standing here just, hey. I was like, guy, come on, get away from me. I really, and I was trying, like, I don't know. I just felt like I can't do that at your job, right? I can't come yeah. to your job. So why are you standing outside this booth, you know, googly eyeing me? You know, I know we had a good time. Like, you know what I mean? I, I feel bad now because I was like, what, that, what if that was the motherfucker that got away? You know what I'm saying? He treated me. It wasn't like he treated me bad. I just was, um, uh, what's that word? Um, church girl. They want nobody. I did something naughty. You know what I mean? So I was okay. trying to uphold this image, but I'm at work. I'm like, I don't want nobody to know I did something with you. Like, dude, you know, whatever. So he, and he, he never came back. And then, so I didn't know any better because I was young. Right. Yeah. So. As I got like in my thirties, and I I started going through my pictures, and I saw the picture, I was like, "Yo, I fucked up." I said I didn't have the the maturity to know that this guy really liked me. You know he what I'm saying? He could have, yeah, yeah, he could have been the one because I haven't had the one or the two since. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm like, "What if that?" So I was like, "Should I go on TikTok and do the whole story and see if anybody could find him or whatever for me?" And I was like, "Nah, I don't do that." I'm not gonna do it. Nah, you know, that... gotta let that go. You might have to just let that go. You had that. Yeah, moment. yeah, but I just think that's a you know? so so that's the wildest thing. Because then after that, I never, I never allowed myself to get like um, attached or interested in anybody that come up to the booth. I don't say shit to nobody. I don't say anything now, because yeah. I saw you on Vice. You on that Vice Land show that sex before the internet. Yes. Show. And shout yes. out to Vice because let me tell yes. you something. That channel is like a whole like less black version of me. Okay? Yes. <laughs> but I want to know this though. What do you remember about the days before the inter internet? Just like overall. Well, there I remember kids before the internet. Just saying. Say it again. I said there was a time before the internet. I'm telling you. Oh yeah. You, oh yeah. Audience. Before the yeah. internet. Well, what I I like for me to meet people, I was doing that uh, Kiss FM hotline. I don't know if you remember that the hotline for Kiss FM. So I was meeting people that way, um, and uh, that was kind of cool. It was I I never deemed it like unsafe, um, but I did that a few times. Um, I think that was it. Or just go to the club. I was going to the club a lot. A uh, shadow. Shout out to the shadow. Shout out to the shadow. And, wait, 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 Bentley's. <laughs> you ever now, went to Bentley's? I, I didn't experience Bentley's, but I have okay. experienced the shadow. I did. Yes. And yes, I've so. experienced the boat rides. Right, yes. Yeah. So th that's, that was that how again, <laughs> that's how we were getting out and navigating and right. inter interacting with people. But like I said, I grew up in Coney Island. And to me, our community, we had, you know, people was jamming outside in Kaiser Park uh, or 288 Park. So we always had something to do um, to interact with one another. And um, But when I came to transit as a young woman, I was scared. Like, I didn't, like, I am now faced with being an adult in adult situations. So I just kept myself um, chased, if you will, until I met, 
you know, that guy. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna do this. And um, what they get, let my freak flag fly, but nobody mm -hmm. got to know about it. Right. That was how, that's basically what I was trying to do. Um, but yeah, so before the internet, you know, I, I think we had a lot more freedom, you know, a lot more freedom to just interact and communicate with people. And you couldn't, like, if you had a beeper, that was another thing. If people had beepers. Um, I had a beeper. Yeah, I had I a, a beeper. I, I, I was resistant. I was resistant to it because, you know, I was I, I didn't want to get a cell phone until, I didn't get a cell phone until 99. Because I was just so resistant to following the people, being part of the horde of people that, but now we can't leave without a phone. We can't. This guy dropped his phone. I'm, I work at an elevated station. Okay. Um, but he dropped his phone down into an area that's locked, and we don't know who owns it, right? Like it's it's closed off or whatever. So he has an iPhone, so of course it pinged down there. So I want to find out today if <laughs> if they were able to locate it and get it for yeah. him. Um, but yeah, like just this being holding to this phone stuff, it really bothers me because the industry charging us all this money for a phone you know what i mean it's like wow they really they really in the, in the internet like everything now is costing us so much more money than when we didn't have the internet right we just had my bell you know the telephone and it's like and remember we got a two-way caller yo that was the shit we had to do star 69 remember do you remember when phones started being touch tone and you had yes. to pay for touch yes. phone phones. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. They find a way to charge us for everything. Everything. Every and why is it that every bill in New York City has an MTA surcharge? Huh? Where that money going to MTA? Where is it going to MTA? The light bill, right? Has it I gas have no bill? No idea. Uber. No idea. Has it? So how mm -hmm. are they? You know, I right, edit that part. No, I'm just kidding. Where I live, I get all of these surcharges on my cable bill. It's called like a broadcast retransmission fee or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the Some cable bullshit. bill is high. Like, the, why, yeah. why is it that cable is the highest bill that I pay? Yeah. I mean, other than, you know, whatever, house yeah. or whatever like that. But cable right. is the highest bill. My yeah. gas and electric don't go over like, you know, 80 bucks. Right. Well, you know, water bill doesn't go over that, but the cable is just so high. The government, every every business entity pays those uh, congressmen, senators in the back pocket or whatever to allow them to regulate or deregulate how they want to do it. Because there's no way. Like T-Mobile just merged with Sprint. Like now it's going to be superpower. Like it's like, how is it possible if y'all merged and shit should be cheaper, right? Like what? Y'all reducing your work. They need to get their superpowers together because, again, where I live, it's a dead zone. So I'm always on my Wi-Fi. There's this thing that we're dealing with, especially in our black and brown communities, and it's called the digital divide. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they do in certain areas is they throttle the Wi-Fi. So you go to, I'll just say it, a white area. A, a suburb with a higher socioeconomic, you know, status and, and a higher, you know, median income. And you can download stuff all day. You can upload, download, you never get cut off. But when you go to certain areas that are, you know, black and brown, you have issues. Your internet cuts off. Why? And it's Why not fair. We... Right. It's not. It's not. It's not. not fair. And you're right. You're right. That's true. That you is know? true. I um I only have internet. I haven't watched TV in about seven years, maybe eight. But here's the thing, though. You talk about an era when we didn't have these phones, we didn't have, you know, all these different devices and everything. What was stand-up like back then, back when you started? When I started, I was bad. <laughs> I didn't, I, you know, there's a rhythm, really? there's a rhythm to stand up. There's a cadence. You have to know who you are on stage. So you can be able to present yourself properly to the audience. So you have to know what you're talking about. You have to um, share instead of sell. Because in the beginning I was selling these jokes. I was like, oh, I got to get these jokes. One of my, <laughs> okay, I'm going to tell you one of my jokes. Um, 
I Jeffrey Dahmer, right? The mm -hmm. story about Jeffrey Dahmer was popular. I said, you know, Jeffrey Dahmer's mother wrote a cookbook. It's called Mama Dahmer's Soul Food Recipes. I said, Jeffrey's favorite dish was chicken ketchup nigga. <laughs> And spaghetti and mooly balls. And, oh, it was awful. It was awful. People was like, mm, you know, people groaned. Some people laughed. But it was like, to me, that was, oh, I, I'm being clever. I'm being funny. But it was it was basic. It was a basic joke. Um, but I thought it was funny. I was like, oh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a genius. That was, a matter of fact, I, my first time on stage is March of 1996. I know it was in the 20s, somewhere in the 20s. Mm -hmm. um, so that was my first time, but I was, I am a huge Billy Crystal fan. So if you know anything about Billy Crystal, he does montages. So yes. I wrote a montage and all I, the beginning is like, you know what? I ran into my cousin, Vinny. He told me that my aunt, Dolores Claiborne, has become a menace to society. So I started naming, I made a story with all the movies in the 90, 96, 95, 96. I said, yeah, there was a single white female and da 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 da. And that yeah. was like a highlight of my life because I did, you know, I um, pay homage to uh, Billy Crystal and it worked. The audience loved it. Um, I haven't done it since. It's written somewhere in one of my notebooks, but that was one of the highlights of, you know, doing my first time doing stand up. Uh, but as I uh, took the workshops and as I, you know, performed, you, you know, you just have to believe in yourself and um, you can't seek validation from the audience. Like the audience mm -hmm. isn't there to work through your issues with your parents, okay? Because a lot of people get on there and they're trauma. They got trauma, right? So in order yes. to heal your trauma, people yes. go and do comedy thinking, and then when they don't get the result, they're angry at the audience because they, oh, you ain't laughing, oh, y'all suck. No, work through your shit. So one of the things that I was fortunate, I got a workshop with this um, coach, Tim Davis. He gave, he taught us the 12 steps of comedy because he was in his 12 step program, but he was able to transfer it into stand up. And he gave us like zero was no self-esteem. You get on stage, you have zero self-esteem. You don't have high, you don't have low because that can fuck with your head because all there's a psychology in stand up. Right? When you're talking to the audience. So I have a degree in psychology. I went to school and I got a bachelor's in psychology because I had to figure it out. I had to figure me out. Right. I had to heal myself. Um, I don't know if that's shadow work because I'm like, what the hell is shadow work? But I didn't know if that was shadow work. But I knew in order to understand why my mother did what she did, why my dad did what they, he did, I had to figure me out. Mm -hmm. And I do stand up. Um, I'm very observant. And so I love to do crowd work. Some people think, oh, crowd work. I love to do crowd work because I ask specific questions based on how I'm feeling. And I can get a whole bunch of information. For instance, last night I did a show and um, well, I thought they were together. They weren't. So I hooked them for the night. Like they exchange information. So she's a beautiful white couple. Well, they, they should be a beautiful white couple, hopefully. But the guy fucked it up. He fucked it up. Uh he fucked it up so but when i'm talking to him and i was he's like oh uh she's like oh he's in um he's in law enforcement and so i looked at him i said oh you, you fbi right he's like oh, how do you know i said listen i said it's just it's a gift like i have a gift mm -hmm. i did a show tuesday and i just said something random about black don't crack i said but we do gain weight i said because you sir i could tell because he was a black guy i said i could tell sir you're about 45 and the girl, when I she was a comedian, she said, how did you know my friend was 45? I said, I did it. I said, but I know I have a gift. And yes. I have never, like, I don't, I don't like focus on it, but I know that I do. If I were to, I guess, train I'd be mm -hmm. better, but I just love interacting with people, get like ask just random questions. But when I do that, I get so much information and insight yes. that they don't even realize it. And I just make, if you ever see me on stage, I'm having a good time. Mm -hmm. I'm having a good time. You're yeah. having a good time. And everybody's leaving with, you know, knowing that they had a good time. Let me tell said, you, I've been watching your videos for like the past couple of days and your videos have turned into like my little quick pick-me-ups. Because they're clips. They're clips. Like I, I don't have like a full, like, you know, right, 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 thing. right. 
but they're like quick pick me ups because you know how to get right to the point with the yes. joke. Yes, yes, thank and, you. And, and, and you and you are the punchline. You know what I'm right. saying? Right. And you thank know you. how to get thank and and, and I, I like when I don't have to think in order to laugh. That's the important. And that yeah, that's the so so so. There's this. There's a there's there's arguments in stand up. That's what I said. I love crowd work. I love talking to the audience, getting information and creating right then and there, because the magic is how do I make something right now funny in front of these people? Yes. Right. And to me, that's a skill set that, you know, you just naturally born with. So I love to do that. And so um, it's comics that stick to their script. If OK, so one of the things is, as Tim taught us in the 12 steps, if you're in a, in the show, and the waitress drops a glass and you keep doing your set, you're a bad comedian, he says, because you're supposed to acknowledge that she dropped that glass. You're supposed to say something to, you know, you got to stay present in the room. And it's all about being aware. Exactly. You have to exactly. be aware. You have exactly. to have an awareness. And, that, and that's the thing I, I mention all the time is I pay attention to everything. Right, I'm noticing right. everything. Like when you came on, I noticed that picture because that picture's on the website. Yes. And that's a beautiful picture, by the way. But I noticed that picture because I said, wow, never have I seen in all my years, and this, and this is sad, it's a shame, but never have I seen so many Black female comics in one place. Yes. And even with this, like I have questions and everything, but you are so intuitive that I haven't even had to ask you anything because you're giving me what I was going to ask you. Wow. Well, even yeah, though there are other things that I am going to ask right, that you didn't right, pick up on yet. Right. But but what I want to know is though, what did your father say about you doing comedy? What did he say about that? You know, he passed away before. My dad, my dad um had a TBI, traumatic brain injury, when I was 15. And he didn't know who I was. Oh. Yeah, so I lost my dad, right? He was still alive, but I had to reconcile with that. They told him I was his daughter. He was all right. He was like, oh, okay, whatever. But my little brother was born at that same time. And so he knew who he was because he knew that was his son. Right. But he, you know, um, and I didn't understand that at that time, but I was grateful for the time that I did have with my dad. So I was able to say, oh, universe allowed me to be raised by him so that I can have an understanding of what it is to be around a black man so I don't be out in the streets acting crazy. You know what I mean? Because sometimes you, a lot of women, a lot of people, a lot of kids, when they don't have either parent in their life, there's a lot of things that can go awry. So I had that experience. So I was like, hmm. Not to say I don't need a man, but I'm not going to act like I got, to, uh, there's a deficit. You know what I mean? There's no deficit. So um, I had that experience, but my father had the accident. Um, that's, I know, I know I have a gift because my family was acting funny, right? I just noticed everybody walking on eggshells and nobody was talking to me and stuff. And I was like, something's not right. So he was in a coma for two weeks before they told me what happened. So I guess when they wanted, when he got out the coma, they told me. So I had to race, run up to Connecticut because by, by that time I was back in New York and Coney Island. So I went up there to see him. And when I walked in, and he just looked at me like, who is this? And that was... When the doctor explained to me that, you know, it's going to take him a while to get his memory back, da 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 da, he never got it back. But I still loved him because I knew he was my dad. And the accident happened. It was it was a bad accident because my father told you was an alcoholic on the weekend. So the so my stepsister, uh, I was 15, she was 17. He asked her to clean up because the baby's coming home. The baby's going to be born. The baby's going to come home. This is in Connecticut. So he was being the typical teen, and he went to grab her as, they were, as she ran up the steps, and he fell back, hit his head on the corner of a fireplace, stone fireplace, the, mm -hmm. the, the back of his uh, hypothalamus. And so when she saw him laying there, she just thought he was drunk. 
because he always yeah. drank. She left him there. He was a, he was he was that way. So when when my stepmom, he didn't come to the hospital. He didn't come to get the baby. Nobody right. knew what happened. That's when she came home and found him on the floor. Oh, that's why he was wow. in a coma. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so when I heard all that story, I wanted to beat the shit out of my stepsister. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because, you know, so, yeah. Um, wow. Yeah. And you know, you bring something up when you tell me this. Um, something that I talk about all the time is that within our community, we deal with so much trauma. Just so much. And, and, and things happen. And then we have to get washed, get dressed, and just go to school and just go off to the next thing. Or get up, get washed, get dressed, go to work. Like there's no one there to really say, hey, it's okay. Take a minute. You can cry, you can let yes. it out, you can do yes. whatever you have to do. We don't get that opportunity. And it's so easy for others to exactly. just come in and say, oh, well, why didn't you do this? Or why didn't you do that? Because we don't have that privilege. But, you know, we talk about just overcoming things. And, and I know you said when you first started, you were bad, mm. you know, but now you're selling out the shows. Yes. You know, because Joe's yes. is sold out in, in, in Boston. Yes. And, uh, and, and Baltimore, not Baltimore, Silver Spring, Maryland, and okay. D.C. So now we're All going in, in New York, in New York, okay. uh, always in New York. Um, and now we're going to Philly and then Virginia. Right. I said I was gonna chill because the festival's in June. I was like, I was like, why the hell would you start a mini tour and you got a whole festival coming up? Why, why would you do that to yourself? And that's because you love it. That's why. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah, you yeah. love it. And yes. now, um, New York is uh, March twenty seventh, right? Yes, at the Grizzly so, Pear. At the Grizzly Pear. Right. I'm gonna it's put the all new, that information up. Right. It's a new, um, a new comedy club that opened up. Right. Not too far from where Caroline's used to be, because you know Caroline's closed. Right, uh, right. I was there for New Year's Eve when uh, she closed, <clears throat> and so Grizzly Pears is, is is you know making noise. It's a nice club. It's really nice inside. The food is good. Um, so I'm there on on March 27th. Joke Sisters, and I diversified this show. Um, there's white women, Spanish women, black women, uh, and this time around because listen, Black History Month is going to be black. Sorry. <laughs> it's gonna be black, and so. But it's Women's History Month this month, so right. That's why it's the first, right? That's women. why it's the first, right? right. And, and listen, everybody, y'all still have time to get those yes. tickets yes, before you do. they sell out. Yes, I'm going yes, to put all right. the information up, so Thank don't you. worry. You know, I, you. everything's going to go up. But I'm curious though, and this is see now. This is where I start to get a little messy. I start okay. asking questions. Sure. How do the shows work? Do they pay you all up front, or do you get a portion of the house like the musicians? Um, I guess all the, yeah, the money, this is my show, my production. Okay. I get all the money from the door. So then from nice. the door, I pay all the comedians. Okay. That's, that's, nice. that's the formula that most New York comedy clubs do. Or okay. I can do something and find a place, rent it out, like pay up front, a rental put a fee, mm -hmm. and then charge whatever I want and, you know, still pay the comedians, but make right. more money, I guess. Awesome. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I'm happy. Yeah, I'm happy with the setup right now. Um, I know when I retire, it's going to be a whole lot different. Um, my goal has been to open up my own club. I used to and manage. you want to have that. Let me tell you something. Thank you. You're going to manifest you. that. Yes, yes, and, yes, yes. You're going to have that. And and when you open that club up, you're going to come back on the show because by then this is yes. going to be, you know, on TV. TV. Oh, the show. Yes. Okay. The show. So yes. let me tell you, and I'm going to come and I'm going to be there and I'm going to eat. I'm <laughs> thank you. Thank the, you. The, the, all the different diets. All the I'm things. Those. All the things. All the That's what yeah. we're trying to do. Like Angela, Angela Bassett, all the things. She's doing all yes. the things. Getting all the things. I'm so happy that she's getting her flowers. Cheryl Lee Ralph. Every, it's, I feel like the renaissance of Black women has, is like right now, last four to five months, it's been a resurgence. But, you know, Trevor Noah said it before he left. Like, if y'all want to know what's going on in society, talk to Black women. Y'all need to start checking That's on Black why women. That's I'm doing this show. Yes, I'm yes, talking really. to Black women because I, wow. I, I'm going to tell you something, Joanna. I have a duty. And my duty is is to uplift 
and wow. inform, inform, but also right. uplift. And I've seen so many shows on YouTube, so many podcasts where these black men are sitting around bashing black women. And I'm not doing that. I don't do it in real life and I'm not doing it on here. Yeah, and I, I have a duty as a black man, I have a duty and a responsibility to uplift and inform. And that is what I'm going to do, period. So if anybody has a problem with it, you fucking well. You, if you wanna see foolishness, then you know where to go. It's not gonna be here. I don't engage in that kind of um, debates because it's moot, it's moot. Like it you is. have your opinion, especially with the keyboard warriors. I um, did a podcast with a comedian not too long ago. It's called We Are Done Here. And I talk about- um, Oh, with Mika. I love Mika. Right, Mika. Yes. Right, Mika. Yes. And they had to talk about yes. uh, my heterotopic pregnancy stare. And she did a clip of me talking about uh, how happy I am I don't have any children. And somebody in the comments was like, oh, she looks so sad. Oh, she's so sad. She don't... And I'm like, damn. So what all that taught me was, when you go to YouTube, mind your business. If you're not going to put a heart emoji, a thumb up, don't comment on what you perceive it to be because it's not real because I was on, in that seat. And I was like, no, that's not what I was feeling. So why would you say that? So I said, oh, it's a perception that people have. They try to, you know, the pseudo psychology. I said, but no, I said, well, you sure? It wasn't because I worked 16 hours and didn't get any sleep. That That's why I look tired. Like, maybe that's why I look like that. It wasn't that I was sad. I don't have any kids. Um, but yeah, it was just weird that like No, people... that's projection. They're sad because they don't have any kids. Yeah. Well, yeah, they're sad guy... because they have kids and they don't like those little bastards. That's what that is. Yeah, that's another thing. Because I was like, a, a lot of women that I've met, you don't have any kids? No. So, oh, you're so lucky. And I was like, mm, I have a choice. You have a choice. You know exactly. what I mean? And so exactly. it's it's um but the, the heterotopic pregnancy was um was an eye opener because again, doctors not listening to black women, you know what I mean, not paying attention to that that we're unique and different. And so that was just, you know, uh something I experienced and we gotta just... put a pin in that because I am gonna ask you about that. Okay. I am. Because and, see, and and I'm a stupid man here. I'm thinking I thought pe pregnancy was a hetero topic. <laughs> but you're gonna break everything down for me. Yes. That's why I like having you here because you can you can just you gotta break it down for me like I'm four. I, I love it. <laughs> I love it. But okay. what do, you do right before a show though? Like, what's your pre-show ritual? Because everybody has like a ritual right. before okay. they go on. So ten, what's yours? Ten years ago, nobody could talk to me. Like I was so scared and so nervous. I did not want nobody to talk to me. None of my my team members, the audience. I had such a stoic face, a game face, but it was more because I was afraid that I was going to fail, that I was going to forget everything, that I was not going to be funny. And then I um, I created laugh tracks, right? Because I worked for ETA. I love to laugh and I'm, I'm working on the tracks. So and that's you how also did created. Swipe This too. You did Swipe yes, This. Yes, Swipe This was my solo uh -huh. show talking about my life in transit. Right. So after I became comfortable with who I am, who I am, I stopped being that stoic person. I can interact with people now before the show. I'm like real relaxed. And now I just get on, get on, stage and I'm just me. Tuesday, yesterday, is it? No. Yeah, Thursday I did the show and I, anyway, I just, the guy before me talked about his dad. He's a, he's a biracial kid. Okay. Uh, well, man now, but he was a biracial kid and his dad was like this 6'4 black man and they look white. So they would act up. And so he was like, you know, they used to do stuff because they knew his dad was like conscious that he would be yelling at two white kids and he and, and the boys knew it, right? So he said his dad got, you know, what he said, diabolical. He said he would like get to them real close and like touch their shoulder and says, uh, if you don't cut it out, I'm gonna take your face and put it on his face and take his face and put it on your face. He was saying low. Yeah, he said it low, but he said they just saw face off. So they, yeah. got, they got in line. So I thought that was funny. So that helped me when I came up 
on stage to talk about my dad because I went, I didn't have, listen most of the time I don't know what I'm gonna talk about so that's why I like to listen to what's going on in the room so mm -hmm. when he brought up his dad I brought up my dad I said yeah I said I was my dad wing woman which I was at eight years old because he was a single father and women love single fathers so in Connecticut you know white women black it didn't matter they said oh that's your daughter so that's what I said that was his wing woman and so that is what I love about where I'm at now as a comic, like I don't, I'm I'm still nervous. Like I get that butterfly feeling, but once I hit the stage, it's like I'm home. I'm home, and I can say anything. And everything. now, are those coming back though? Those shows because I know you had the one woman show, and then you had the the group of of other uh, transit workers, which you are. Will they are those coming back? Well, no, my team, uh, my team disbanded. Uh, COVID okay. really put a, a damper. Everybody started taking stock in their lives. You know, um, even me, I was like, what am I going to do? Like, okay, so yeah, there's some more, there's, there's some more trauma, but there's like, I always look for the lesson and the blessing, right? So in 1998, I met my fiance and we were dating and we decided to move in together. And I was in college. I was working nights and I was pursuing stand up. And he is Nigerian. And he was like, hey, I don't see you. I don't see you. How are we going to get to know each other? Blah, blah, blah. You out in the club. You work in the I don't get to see you. I quit comedy. I stopped comedy. I stopped comedy for two and a half years. So. I wasn't happy. That's when the heterotopic pregnancy happened, all of that right. stuff. So within that time frame, I wasn't happy, but you know, I'm trying to do the right thing. 9-11 happened. I walked in the door because I'm working nights. Where should I put it? It was an ominous day. I was driving home. I kept hearing fire. So I, but I didn't know what was going on. I didn't hear nothing on the news. I was listening to my CD right. or whatever, shopping. Nobody saying anything. I get into the apartment. And the TV, it's like we had a big screen TV. Um, um, and um, it said it was a screen of the World Trade. I dropped the bags and I just bust out tears because the company that I worked with before MTA was on the 100th floor of the World Trade. So now I'm, my people that I used to work with is in the building. So I'm like, huh, what's going on? So he, he's hugging me, consoling me. And that's when the second building collapsed. And or you saw people out like standing there about to jump or whatever. And so I see all of this and I just pull away from him, Chris, and I say, I'm leaving you. And he's like, Well, what are you talking about? I said, I'm leaving you. And he didn't, you know, and then we jumped in my car because my cousin still worked at the company. So I was going to find her. I don't know how the hell I was going to find her, but I went to go find her. And um I moved out the next month. I found an apartment. I moved the fuck out because what I realized all those people died, not fulfilling their dreams, right? They all had dreams and comedy was my dream and I was not living it. I said, I'm going to honor those people that died. I'm going to pursue comedy. So I moved out. And I asked the universe, this is like, okay. So manifestation, manifestation is real. I said to it people, is. I said, I'm looking for an apartment. I'm only want to pay 500 gas and let you conclude it. This is 90, this is 2001. And it's like, oh, you crazy. You ain't going to find that. In Canarsie, I found a full basement, 550 gas and let you conclude it with a driveway for my car. So uh, that happened. And so I finished school. It yes. Works. Yes, you have. Well, I have to always remember that is there because you get so caught up in in the three D, as they say, that you forget. So I graduated in two thousand two, May of two thousand two, and June I went back to the comedy club, and as they say, the rest is history. So I started all over again, and it's one of the um, most pivotal moments in my life that I I chose. I chose me, right. I chose me, so I consciously make an effort to to honor those moments in my life when I'm like, Joe, you have to do the right thing. The right thing is your happiness, and and right now this 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 guy isn't it. Yeah. 
after I left him, after I started back doing comedy, he came to a comedy show. What is right? You are funny. And I wanted to just punch him in the throat. <laughs> because what I was hoping is while we were dating and moving in together, get married, that I could leave transit and pursue because I had agents and managers like, yo, you funny, you got the goods, you know? And so that's why, okay, so that happened, right? I stopped comedy for two and a half years. So do you know, I never dated. I never dated again. Like I had like Since flings or whatever. 2001? Right. I didn't do it because wow. I did not want any man telling me I can't do my comedy. You know what I mean? Because I felt like I had to make a choice. They were going to make me choose comedy or them. And I was like, I'm not choosing no more. I want comedy. Comedy sustains me. Comedy gives me life. And so I was dating this guy, going out with this guy, and we just had a conversation. And I told him the same story about my ex or whatever. He's like, but I've been to the show. You mad funny. He said, yo, I would have definitely supported you. Then it clicked. I was like, oh shit, not all men. I, like I said, even with the guy in the table, like I didn't, I was uh, all or nothing. Like I didn't understand there was radiations yes. of things. Like I was just like, okay, uh, what should they say? If somebody tell you something, just like, I'm going to not do it. Because I'm not, I don't need to experience it. Because you already told me. Yeah. Like in comedy, when I started in '96, there was a couple, right? They were in love. Oh, they were in love, and I was like, oh, I want that. And then they broke up, and they were vicious on stage. They shared all the tidbits and. Wait just... a minute, they were a comic couple. Yes, they... yes, they were a comic couple that was oh, in I love. Oh, I know that was. Oh, I know that was. Similar. Right. So I said, oh mm. shit. So I never dated a comedian. I was like, I, I gotta, I, I learned from watching other people, and I never dated a comedian. I've never allowed myself to date a comedian. I never, like, I never dated another customer, um, because I was like, I don't need the headache. I don't. Well, so, but, like, I have to right now. I'm in a good space with my life where I could, like, oh, you know, you could let your hair down a little bit, like, you could relax. You know what I'm saying? You know, so. Um, I am doing that, right? But just knowing that uh, I'm happy. I'm like, that was the direction I had to go because discipline, right? Yes. Discipline. You have to learn discipline and the spirit of discernment. So now I'm able to hear what a man is not saying to me, which is just as important as what they do say. And so, and, yeah, absolutely. Right. So absolutely. that's where I'm at right now. Yeah. I'm, I'm in the place. And, where... and, and you know, and in and, 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 and everything you said, the lesson that I'm picking up is, is what's for you is for you. Who's Amen. for you is for you. Exactly. People, places, and things. If it's meant for you to have and it's meant for you to experience, you will. And that's And where it I'm also at. goes into the power of flow. I don't know if you've ever read that book or heard of that theory, the power of flow. I, I it's in the same vein of law of attraction and yes yes, yes, yes. Right, yeah. power flow is a little more um i think on because me and you we have, we're, we're on a wavelength today i think it's a little more on our wavelength as yeah. far as like you know um energy and right. attraction oh one of okay i learned from power of flow is if you're one of those people who people please whatever you think you should be doing do the opposite because a lot of people pleasers aren't thinking about themselves. They're thinking about other people. Right. They're worried true. about what the that's other person is doing and how that's they can true. make the other person happy. And right. once I did that, things started coming into alignment. Like with this, I mean, yeah. with, with this show, that's because I, I was just going to work my job and probably not pursue this and do anything. And the whole struggle was, you know, getting people to come on because I knew. So right. it wasn't that I had a bad product because my product is good. It looks good. Mm -hmm. You know, it sounds good. Everything is on point. But it was, well, who are you? You know, you're me. And that's why I'm so grateful for you for coming on. Because you you came on sight unseen. Like, that's a big deal for me. <laughs> you know, you know there, there shows out. There shows. But sight unseen you came on. And the, and the fact that you took your time out, you sacrificed your beauty rest, for my foolishness, okay, because 
we about to get more foolish. Don't worry. We're okay, about to all right. Foolish. But <laughs> the fact that you sacrificed your beauty rest for me, the fact that you came on and, you know, we know each other in passing, but we don't know each other that well. But the right. fact that you did my show over people who I do know who, you know, get a little fancy and, you know, they, you know, I don't know what it is, Joanna. Honestly, niggas do me 12 and they do, you know, independent films and shit like that. And they think that, you know, they, they, they can bread from you and leave you on red for weeks. But I'll just say wow. this. I'll just say this and I'm a I'm gonna move on to the next thing, you know. The the I've been getting emails and people have been interested, the people who have seen some of these this stuff. And I'm just gonna say, baby, those calls come in. Don't call me talking about can I be on your show? Because I gave you the opportunity. Yes. Yes. I gave Isn't that you something? the opportunity. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that I is, you. thank you, thank you. I am. Did I just shrink? How did I get down? Okay. Okay. Bam. <laughs> Listen, um, and yes. whatever you do over there, I can fix. So don't worry about it. I can. Oh, fix okay. It. All right. Okay. Cool. 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 Don't worry about it. Um. But yeah, I am. Um. A chef. I'm flowing with these things because, listen, I got in at about eight thirty. I said, let me just text him and say I can't do it. I said, no, Joe, keep your word. Girl, this is the year. Yes. Keep your word. You know what I mean? Yeah. Keep your word because one of my good friends who's doing the show with me in Philly, I heard her, right? She had a show pre-COVID. I was supposed to be on the show. But I worked so much overtime that I crashed and I missed her show. And it hurt her. So we, every now and then, she brings it up. And so I know that hurt her, right? I really, I was like, damn. Because, you know, I'm like, shit, you know, you know, I work for like 50, 60 hours extra. Like, so I figure everybody understands, right? That this is what Joe does. She, she burns the candles on both ends. It hurt her. That's all I can say. It hurt her. And I... Understood it hurt her, but last yesterday when we talked about it and she brought it up again, I said, damn, she, she hasn't forgiven me fully of it, right? So me pitching to her to be part of Philly is my way of, you know, trying to reconcile it. Like, hey, sis, I am truly sorry. And then she shared some other stuff and I was like, oh, no, 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 no. No, it was nothing, had nothing to do with that. I was fucking tired. And I do that to myself because I, it's just me. I don't have a husband. I don't have any kids. It's just me. So if I don't have what I need, I don't have no one I could call on because it's hard for me to ask for help. It's hard because the no's, the no's are fucked up from somebody that's a yes sir or a people pleaser, you know what I mean? So knowing that I've said yes to so many people and that I can't get a yes, I was like, fuck it, I gotta work. I gotta do this overtime. I gotta make sure I get it. And so that's what I do. And so 2023, 20, I told my people in Cold Reality, my friends and family, because they don't see me. I said, you know what, this year, I'm gonna do better. I'm seeing my friends, my family, I'm gonna make it. So my girlfriend, we did a surprise party for her in Pony Island. I showed up. Everybody was surprised to see me. I'm in there drunk, crying. I just bust out crying, like, oh, I miss everybody. Tequila do that. That's my shit. Tequila. Yes. That's yes. keto friendly. Ah, it's keto friendly. <laughs> With soda. <laughs> it is. So yeah, so that it made me feel good that I'm keeping my word. Like Joe, just keep your word. Do whatever you have to do. Just keep your word. And if you can't do something, it's okay to say no. It's okay to say no. Say it. Please, please say yes. it again. Yes. I, it again. I realized that because I was that person that always said yes, even though I didn't want to say yes. I wanted right. to say no. And then I would do, uh, I would ghost somebody or I wouldn't answer my phone. I would do, uh, what's that? I forgot what they call that behavior. Passive aggressive shit. Yes. Instead of just saying no. Yes. Uh, so I said, you know what? Just say no. Uh, one of, like we we're trying to crowdfund for the festival because most of the funding comes out of my pocket. That's another reason why I work overtime and stuff. So I've been looking for sponsors, um, 
to help out, you know, um, the festival, if I, if in all honesty, the festival runs, uh, the bill is probably like no more than seven grand. I'm like, if I wanted to make money, you know what I'm saying? But if just to cover the basics, it's about seven grand, right? If I'm being honest, t-shirts, banners, um, paying the headliners, photographers, video, videographers, and, you know, stuff like that if you have a link to that crowdfunding too i want you to send it to me i don't know we haven't even said we haven't set it up yet we don't know how to do it me and my coach we say how do you do a crowd i said i don't know i truthfully cannot add nothing else to my plate that's what i was telling her i said right right i i don't know nothing about crowdfunding but i know i'm scheduling the shows i'm booking the venues Mm -hmm. i'm doing all of that right now that i can't even figure out how to do crowdfunding at the moment. I just called, I just, I just downloaded chat GPT to show me how to do a chart so I could schedule. Cause I don't know how to do none of that. The Google shit, it showed me, he said, Oh, well you need to do this, that do the days, the venue, the name of the comedians. Da, 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 da. So I was like, Oh, cause I, people that say they're going to help. Then they go. Here's what, I'm, here's, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send you, like how to set up a GoFundMe because okay. GoFundMe is crowdfunding essentially. GoFundMe isn't just, you know, oh, somebody got locked up and we got to raise money to put money on their books. <laughs> what I'll send you is how I'll, I'll, when we get off of here, I'll mm-hmm. um, show you how to do that. To, to okay, GoFundMe. okay. Because that's you know, a good I... way of raising money, raising funds for whatever it is that you're trying to do. You think so? Because I, I was do. like, I, 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 cause I was like, it's go, because I'm always seeing GoFundMe is about somebody sick or dying. And I was like, well, is it, if it is it selfish of me to ask for help for this festival? You know what see, I mean? I'm going to tell you something. Now, see, this, this is, this, I'm going to get real again. I'm okay, real. I appreciate it. That shit is because those motherfuckers don't have insurance. Oh, okay. It was taught to me very young. And I I don't even remember who told me this. Make sure you have insurance, whatever job you sign up for. Get health insurance, get accidental death and dismemberment, get that temporary uh, short-term disability. Yes, 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 I have all of that. All of those insurances. Yes. Because you never know when something might happen to you. And and I was telling you about a young lady earlier I did an interview with, and she's disabled. And she said, anyone can become disabled at any time for any reason. And you just never know. You told me that story about your father. You know, I've had family members who things have just happened, in, in, you know, in a snap. And now they're disabled. Have insurance. That's yes. why people are on GoFundMe. And I don't okay. listen. I don't care if, if they get mad, they can get mad. I don't give a shit. But that's why people are on GoFundMe. Okay. Trying to raise money for so-and-so's hospital bills or somebody's right. Yeah, Yeah. That's why I always felt insurance. like I, I, I'm not, like my category is more like vain, vain. Like why, why should we help her with a festival? Because oh. your festival is bringing attention to a need. It is. You understand what it I'm is. saying? There's it a is. need for what it is that you're doing. That's true. It is. It is. There is a void that you are yes. filling with this mm-hmm. festival. Yes. Because I'm sure all 27 of them women behind you are funny in their own way. Yes. And had it not been for you in that festival, we would never know who they are. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a good, yeah. It's a, there's a void. There's a void. And I guess again, I would, yeah. you know, you're, you're a transit worker. You're a public servant. I mm-hmm. think that when you're a public servant, and shout out to all the transit workers and, and all the police, the fire, the teachers, everybody who, who's a public servant. When you're a public servant, I think that, you know, when you have your other side, you know, hustles and your other things going on, you deserve to be appreciated and rewarded for that because you put up with a lot of fucking shit every yeah. day. Yeah. And you have to have the sense of humor working for the MTA. Okay. So or or I, any agency in yeah, New York. Yeah. For that yeah. Time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because I'm going to tell yeah. you, I've heard a lot of MTA stories. Yeah. Shout out to my friend Melody because she used to work for uh, OFC. She used to work for uh, M- MTA. And, and shout out to Paula because I tell you, between you yeah, and Paula, yeah, 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 yeah. Dog she, she, all the crazy shit. I was at her graduation uh, when she graduated uh, the ceremony. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I have to tell you this other MTA story. Uh, the, the, this the okay. wildest, the wildest MTA story. All right. 19, it's still 96. 
96th. I'm working 28th Street, right upstairs from the shadow. Um, out, of, out of my peripheral on the left, there's a guy beating his meat. Just whack, whack, whack. And I'm like, oh, oh my God, what do I do? So this is what I do. I get on the mic. I was like, hey, you. You want your dick out. Move a little closer so I can see you better. And he takes off running. So I'm like, I won. Because 96, I just started comedy, remember? I just, right, right, so right. that just came off the top of my dome. He took off running. I'm in college, working nights, doing comedy. Guess who shows up the next day? Not the guy beating his knee. He goes, excuse me, miss, remember me? And I was like, shit, I did say, move a little closer, right? Chris, guess who got saved? Baptized in the holy water that same year. So this is the devil. You know how they say the devil coming at you? So all of this is going on. I'm looking at the guy. Mind you, he's fucking handsome. Okay. He's not some okay. derelict. He's yeah. a handsome dude, right? And so, that's, that's um, his kink. That's his kink to, to jack off in right, public. Right. So this is the universe again. This semester, guess what class I'm in? Sexual deviant behavior course. So after the third day, I go to my professor. I go, Professor, there's this guy coming here at the station, taking his dick out. Everybody in the class is like, for real? I said, yeah. She, I said, so what do I do? She said, get an A on your paper. And she gave me a list of questions to ask the guy. He shows up again. So he shows up again. And I was going, hey, come here. Why are you doing this? He looks me in the face and goes, because you cute. I was like, oh, my God. I start, I just so that happened, and so I asked him his name. His name was Tyrone. He mm -hmm. lived in the Bronx. He had a girlfriend. He had a baby, and I'm like, so he's like, "Cause you're cute. I like the way you look." Should have known he was from the Bronx. Should have known. <laughs> but should have known. So, Shout out to the so, Bronx. Should have known. Right. So so the thing is, his name wasn't Tyrone. I don't even know what his name was, but Erica okay. Badu's song was out called Tyrone. So I made it Tyrone. Okay. Right. But okay. everything happened accordingly to that. And um, my one woman show, that's what I opened with. Mm -hmm. Hey, you, you with your dick out. Move a little closer so I can see you better. And I tell you, Chris, I don't know where the fuck that came from. Why would I say that? Just like I said, yeah. she's just like my mother. I I don't know where that came from. It's just in, innately. No. It came from the ancestors. There you go. The comedy, the comedy. I'm I'm a comedian. That's it. That's what that's all this it solidified me saying, Oh, you are funny. You just have to be funny naturally. So that's why I took um acting class. Um the modality that I used was Sanford Meisner. Meisner is a improv improvisational method of acting. Like right now, what we're doing here is what they would call improv. All we need is a script. You know what I mean? It's a body language, just being in the moment. So that's what improv is. And that's what um, Sanford taught. So I'm able to be on stage and take whatever's going on in the scene and make mm. it funny. And that's what I think to me that brings me the most joy instead of staying with the script. Now yeah. that bit of, hey, you with your dig out, that is my signature joke when I'm in New York. If I'm in New York and I'm at a show, I yeah. will do that joke because I know people are like, huh? Transit has afforded me a lot of material. So one of the things that I found to be peculiar, because, you know, I worked the night shift, I'd be looking around, and if you look at the turnstile, the turnstile looked like a vagina. You swipe the Metro card, it looks like a fucking vagina. I said, transit is some shit, man. Transit. Y'all got a lot of shit with y'all. Right? If you think I would have never, got... ever, ever thought that, but you know what? You absolutely right. It is. It's a, a vagina, and you got the men. I was like, yeah, the men don't know how to do it. They just take forever to get through that. You made a post, and a post really resonated with me. It was something that I needed to see, I needed to hear. Um, and you said, it says something about accepting myself as I am right now is the first step to growing and evolving. So I. I live in an apartment in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. That was my mother's apartment and my sister's apartment. So I, I have, I have a full circle moment because remember, my mother didn't want me. That was my story, my trauma. Um, so as I, 
At 38, I had the conversation with her. We talked, healed, talked, healed. Um, so in 2018, my sister had a massive heart attack in the living room. My mom and I were there and we couldn't save her. Three months later, my mom died in her sleep. So I created the festival. She knew about it. But I created the festival in November of 2018. The festival was born, it was due February 2019. My mother, my mother died December. Festival was in February. I was on fumes. And I was on fumes up until June of last year. I did not know that I was suffering. I was in depressed, you know, depression. Um, functional depression, I, I believe. I put on so much weight. Um, so we went to celebrate my mom's birthday. She's a Gemini. And my siblings, we went to dinner. Da, da, da. My older brother sent me pictures of us outside BBQs. And I did not recognize me. And that's when I went keto. <laughs> I went full. I went straight to the supermarket, got my eggs, my bacon or whatever. And I've been keto since. And even with that, uh, as and what I what I found for me, keto, um, there's studies that say keto, as you get rid of the 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 stores of glycogen and the sugar, it the depression is lifted. Yeah, your mute mood changes. And so I started seeing me again. Um, I started seeing me and I just did the commercial with um, Naomi Watts brand called Stripes. And we talked about menopause and the things that I've gone through with menopause. I went through menopause early, but I didn't know it was fucking menopause because we didn't talk about it. Like I didn't know what the hell was going on. Um, and so as I'm starting to understand who I am, the power that I have, that I created something for women, because I would always shrink, or what's that called, imposter syndrome, that I was like, oh, and then I decided, I said, I am enough. I'm okay where I'm at right now. I am worthy. You know, all the, the affirmations that is Black Girl Magic. And I just decided that Joe, start loving yourself, start believing in yourself, and stop feeling like you're not the shit. Dope. I'm dope and I do dope shit. Do you? <laughs> and Period. and so and so that is what I meant when I said I accept who I am right now. I know it's gonna get even better as I get, but I had to come to that term that I'm enough as I am right now, what I'm doing <clears throat> is for the legacy for the years to come because nobody was checking for black women in comedy. There are black women in comedy, right? But as, as you see behind the smiles, the community, the sisterhood, that's what I needed us to have so that we can 100% support one another in this journey because they try to pit us against each other. When you look at the Oscars or the Emmys or all of these shows where we're all so like, not represented, it's it's strange because it's like, you know, when you think about TV back in the 60s and 70s, it wasn't a lot of us on there. We enjoyed it. We still watched it. But <clears throat> I don't know if there was a disconnect. We was like, well, how come we don't see ourselves? Like, how can we enjoy this show and not see ourselves and be okay with that? You know, but but I don't know. I, I want to say that's to the the beauty of us being Black people. Because we're all encompassing, we will we'll accept everyone, right? And and not even realize, hey, we're not in it. And then the shows that we had, you know, I mean, Sanford and Son was funny, but look at his lot in life. You know, they they, they wouldn't, other than George Jefferson, you know, in that capacity. Like it started building from that, but we as a whole, as a as a, a community in this comedy, I want women to know that I got their back, they have mine, that we need to support one another. Whatever gig or opportunity that I hear about, I'm letting you know about it. Because uh, what's for you is for you. There's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing you can stop. 
And that's what it's all about. And I, I, and again, I love that you put that picture up because I, since you've been here in, in the centerpiece of that picture, that energy has been coming over here because wow. I've been having a rough week. I'm just going to leave it at that. We'll, we'll talk about okay. that later. But I needed that. I needed mm -hmm. to see you. I needed to see all those smiling faces because those are genuine smiles. And that is it, a genuine accomplishment. It is because <clears throat> my committee at the time, right? Right. When we had the post festival discussion, because, you know, I was watching how people was moving. And so as after everybody said their piece about what they felt and everything, I said, well, one of the things that I take away from this first year festival, y'all did not believe. Y'all didn't believe in the festival. I said, and and I saw how y'all moved and that's what let me know y'all didn't believe. I said, but I'm glad y'all understand that is bigger than us. Like you can't have an ego in when you're doing a massive uh, undertaking like this. There's no ego involved. It's everyone, you're elevating everyone. And and then what I'm, okay, so part of the festival, it was three days the first year. I specifically sought out a psychologist and a psychiatrist to do a personal mental wellness and self-care workshop. And we could tap in a little bit to our trauma as performers, why is it preventing you from uh, embracing your sister? Why is it prevent? So we all have traumas of, we can't trust black women. We can't trust each other. So let's talk about it. Let's unpack that so that when we move in these comedy streets, they say, nah, you can't fuck with her. That's my sister, you can't fuck with her. So that's the reason. So every year we have a therapist and this is a, a closed door session where we, talk and we get to share and unpack those that want to unpack they unpack because i know that some of us we're meeting each other at a, a space that hey I, I i don't know how to my mom didn't want me i felt abandoned i was in foster care like there's so many variables to who we are so how do we get past that that i can embrace you as a sister as, as someone that's in this this art i love that you've created a space of acceptance, inclusivity, and you're having a good time. Yes. That's the important thing. The important thing yes. is to still have fun, still yes. laugh, but to uplift each other. And again, yes. that's why I'm doing the show. That's, yes. the, that's, that's the whole point of this yes. is to yes. uplift and inspire and empower each other. And, you know, I, I was talking with somebody last night and I said, you know, even if 35 people see this, those are 35 people who had something speak into their existence, spoken exactly. into their existence, exactly. and they learned something. Yes. And they were entertained. And that's it. And that's, and our, that's it. That's our jobs as creatives and as human beings. Because yes. anytime, I, as I said, when two or more are gathered, <laughs> you know, it's about... Um, in uh, instilling and sharing life into people. And that's, every time I look at this picture, I know each and every one of these women, right? They're blossoming. It's, it's, we're in our fourth year. COVID took away one year, but we're in our fourth year. And um, it's just growing. And every woman that has attended, I'm still in touch with. That's why I can go to Philly. Because mm -hmm. I got women from the festival that live in Philly that's on the show. When I went yeah. to Baltimore, I I mean, uh, Silver Spring, like I, so <laughs> when I did the radio in, um, where is it? Silver Spring, well, DC, DMV area. Yeah, right His outside. Name is Jason, Jason Weems. And I just said, yeah, I said, I'm, I'm building a network, you know, sort of like Harriet Tubman. He goes, <laughs> oh, you're the Harriet Tubman of comedy. I said, okay, I'll take it. Because that's what I'm trying to create, a sisterhood, a network, yes. where wherever we go, we got a connection. So mm -hmm. if I'm coming to Alabama, hey, who's in Alabama that I can hit up? and say, hey, I'm coming to town. We got a show I can do. Well, how can I put a show on? in your town that's why i'm going to virginia because donna lewis was in the festival and i'm like hey what, what club is in there that would let us do a show that's how i'm going you know what i mean because i know that instills a connection and a bond and a support that you can't beat that's i i call it we are unofficial sorority that's what we are an unofficial i love that 
I yeah. love that. And that's, that's the whole point of sorority is sisterhood and, and yes. to uplift and empower each other. That's why I'm having you on too for, you know, just because I like you. So that's why I'm having you thank on. But you, also, thank you. I like you I'm too. having you on because it's Women's History Month. Yes, yes. And if you notice on my page, just every couple of days I'm, I'm doing posts of women, Black women who yes. have just made just amazing strides in history. And I'm doing it also because there are states right now in 2023 that are not teaching Black history. Yes. I they know. have banned Black yeah. history. And if that you is- don't get it, if you don't get it in school, where are you going to get it from? Yeah. Because the yeah. parents don't know. But while we're talking about the young people yes. and, and, these, and these young ladies, I want you to tell these young ladies out here what a heterotopic pregnancy is. Because again, I thought pregnancy was a heterotopic. Like, I'm no. a dumb man. What did I know? <laughs> okay, well, there's... a uh, Break that down. Well, um, ectopic pregnancy, regular ectopic pregnancy is when the pregnancy, um, the egg uh, gets fertilized in the fallopian tube. So that's an ectopic pregnancy. So they have to remove the fallopian tube because of the birth, you could die. Right. Heterotopic is when there's an egg in the fallopian tube as well as the uterus. So I had two eggs fertilized at the same time. And so that's where the anomaly came because it's like rare for that to happen. And hey. I equated it to... I'm on my way to see my GYN. I said I was getting birth control. Um, and just before I went in, a salesman went in, pharmaceutical sales, right? With his suitcase. And I believe my GYN gave me this new batch of birth control pills to use. And within that month, this is what happened. And I asked him, I said, were those the pills that that guy gave you. Like, this is something new because, you know, you get all the novel. This was some new silver, whatever. I don't even know. I right. can't even think of it now. But within that month, I went, I went to him complaining of pain. No. Yeah, I went to him complaining. Yeah, I went to him complaining of pain. And because uh, I'm still getting my cycle. And, um, yeah, there was a, uh, I was pregnant. I was pregnant, right? I, I was, was it, I was pregnant. And he was like, what are you going to do? Because I was, I was 34. I think I was 33 or 34 at the time, engaged. And um, mm-hmm. I don't know, because he wasn't the one, right? Mind you, he was, this was two, this is right. 2000. So he wasn't the one. And I was like, ah, I don't have any children. So it's possible. So I went home. I told him this, what was going on. And um, he was like, I don't want no more kids. And I just looked at him. <laughs> so, because he had a son. His son lived in London. Okay. And so, um, my son was seven. I'm laying in the bed and then I just shot up. This pain hit me. And I called my doctor. I said, hey, I said, something's going on. I got this pain. He's like, get into the hospital. No, he told me to come to his office. They did a sonogram. And the sonogram, she's like, you hear that? I was like, yeah, it was a heartbeat. She said, but you hear the other one. I said, listen, bitch, there's nobody beatboxing in my womb. I don't hear no beat, like two beats. Like, I don't hear that. I don't know what you're talking about, but there's no two beats going on. She said, I hear two beats. And so she told, called the doctor. He had me go to another, a more fancier sonogram place on Gerolamin in Brooklyn. Okay. And I went, and next thing you know, like 50 doctors came in. And they're looking at me, looking at the screen. And then it passed. I said, oh, this must be some shit. Yeah. Because, you know, when they come and they study you, they're looking at you like, what the fuck going on with this black girl? And so that's when the guy, the doctor came and said, oh, it looks like you have a heterotopic, da 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 you have to get into the hospital stat. Because the fallopian tube could burst and I could die. And so that they right then and there they sent me to uh the hospital where my doctor's at to perform the surgery. Um, but the 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 one in the uterus, the the one that's normal implanted in the uterus, allegedly was okay. But because of the pills, I didn't trust my doctor. 
I was like, this baby could come out with three arms. You know what I mean? So I was like, I'm not doing it. At this particular time, the hospital did not do abortions. It was a Catholic hospital. I which, was just about to ask you, did it have like a religious name or something? Yeah, let's all of them, don't they? Mount Sinai, Beth Israel. Yeah. That's what but I those realized. are the ones that won't do those. Because right. I know someone who had a similar situation. She had to have a DNC. And they right, that's abortion. Yeah. Right. They wouldn't do the yeah. DNC. She yeah. had to go to um Voices. I think SUNY. I think she had oh, to go okay. to SUNY to have okay. it done. But, SUNY, right. Yeah, I think SUNY yeah. is a, 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 a school hospital as opposed to a religious. Because I'm like, wait right. a minute. Why is religion in the hospital? Why should it be separation? Right? So so I I went and I had the abortion. And that same day, I had an IUD inserted. Okay. I had the IUD inserted. Um, I think it was like 350 at the time. And mm-hmm. I did that. That's what I was like. I ain't fucking with you with no birth control pills. No more doc. Listen, because I thought it was the super sperm. I thought homeboy had the super sperm. You know, the super sperm. <laughs> That's what I, I thought it was. Well, I, the, listen, the doctor will not own. He didn't own up right. to the fact that it was a birth control pill. And because I wasn't um, uh, savvy, like medically, okay. like I didn't investigate it to, to, to do the testing to find out if these pills or the cause of this, because it's unheard of. Like, who? Right. How does that? Ha- how does? How do you eggs... have two babies at the same that aren't twins, mind you? Exactly, they weren't twins. Exactly, exactly. So I don't know, and so I was okay once I. So that was also the beginning of me saying I don't want to be with this motherfucker, right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. He, ain't the- yeah. Um, because he was so cold. Because he okay. So after they did the fallopian uh, extraction, I don't know what they call fallopian. Fallopianoscopy, I don't know what the hell they call it. But once they removed my fallopian tube, I still had the regular pregnancy. And he right. was scared that I was going to keep the baby. So he wasn't talking to me. He wasn't consoling me while I'm recovering, you know. And I was like, oh, this motherfucker. I said, you already knew he wasn't for you. All right. So you just, you know, um, Fast forward to today, he wants me to do a comedy show at his venue. <laughs> yeah, we come full circle again. I we see. Still, we we cool, but like okay. whatever. we cool. Um, but he's he's doing great. Yeah, things well, I mean, listen, if the price is right, you know. Right. Um, I mean, I would send somebody else there. I don't have the time. Okay. But I would I would give someone else that spot. Some a younger comic that's coming up. Yeah, I'll definitely got you. That. And all money um, isn't good money. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You have to tell yeah. everybody that too. Yes, that is true too. Um, I had to learn that. I had to learn that um, when I, I managed a comedy club in Brooklyn for seven years, um, and it was the most important part of my comedy career. To learn the inside of how to run a comedy club, how to run the business, and the people mechanics. You know, um, I learned a lot about that, and I learned about it myself. I'm a sucker. I'm a like. I'm a like. I'm not gonna say a sucker. Like, like I'm nice. Like I'm really that nice person. I want to see everybody win, to the f- point where it was a detriment. I was too nice right. to people that didn't deserve it, and so that's why I say I am where I'm at right now. I love who I am. I love what I'm evolving to. And I can say no whenever the fuck I want to. Be okay with it's it. It's important to say no. Right. Don't yes. just not say anything. Right, say right. No. right. Because yes and no are heavy on respect. So it's important to say either one, yeah. yes or no. But you know, yeah. I'm glad that you're telling the story. I'm glad that you're opening up and you're telling these young women out here about this because you have to be very careful. Birth control at some times can be faulty, even for us men, because I know of a football player who still went on to have like two, three more kids after the second. Whoa. Antonio Camardi. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I know. He still so, went so on then... after the, the vasectomy. So, I mean, maybe he had the super sperm. I don't or, know. Or the doctor fucking lied. Like, I don't, tr- like, if he, you know what I'm saying? You got to figure out these. Listen. Yeah, I don't know. It, I, it's that's, not if, if all. It's, it's not foolproof. It's not. Yeah, you have to be very, very careful. Right, and I say this too 
Oh, go ahead. No, no, no. You so there, there's a picture out there. I don't know if it's real or not of a little baby with the IUD in his hand. <laughs> they pulled him out of the mom's, you know, after he's born. They got a picture of him with the freaking IUD in his hand. <laughs> I was like, now, oh, listen, shit. I don't know. In this era we live in, anything, I don't know. That, yeah, that, exactly. It could be real, could be. Yeah, but yeah. I want you to break down menopause to us men, though, like we're four. Because you know, I told okay. you earlier, I need you to break stuff down. Right, right. So break well, the menopause down for us. Um, menopause is the end of the woman's ability to have children. Just put it that way. The cycle stops, you know. Um, so that's the big thing. The cycle stops. So that means the um opportunity to have babies ends, right? And that's supposed to be the beginning of the menopause stage. But menopause is a whole, just like when a, a young girl is going into the puberty stage mm -hmm. and experience the cycle, the breast enlargement, all of the shaping of a puber, pu pubescent teen is the opposite when it becomes to menopause. All of that shit shuts down. The hormones change, um, your body regulates itself. Um, and if you're not aware of what's happening, it looked like a bipolar bitch. Like she's going crazy. All of a sudden she's sweating. She's sweating for no reason. She don't know where it's coming from because the body is regulating itself. The hormones are shifting. That's why some women go on hormone replacement therapy, which there's a disparity because black women aren't offered that, right? When I started getting symptoms, I think I was like 44, 40, like 42. And that's young, right? That's young. To, but I didn't know. I was still getting my cycle. My cycle was clocking. My cycle was on point. And um, then it wasn't. <laughs> you know, it was like, oh, up. It would, it would be gone for, mind you, uh, I was not a tampon person. But because of this shit, I started being a tampon person. Because you never know when the shit popped up. And so... And uh, so after like seven months, I was like, ah, I'm in menopause. Ah. Boom, the cycle started. So that went on for about two or three years. And then but I had wait to go a minute. You thought you were done. Yes. And then it came back. Yes. And there's nothing in my body oh, that no. say, hey, this is, it's called perimenopause. So that's okay. the beginning stages of, I guess, you know, if you wouldn't equate it to getting breasts when you're a kid, like you 12 or whatever, your breasts start showing up. So when perimenopause is the beginning stages of you changing into the way of menopause fully, full, full on menopause. So um, once my cycle, uh, well, I went and did the test. There's a, a FSH, a follicle something. Hormone. There you go. Right. Mm -hmm. So I did that yeah. test and she's like, oh yeah. I was, what do you mean? Oh yeah. That's it. <laughs> oh yeah. And so, and I still had the IUD. I was like, I'm going to rock this IUD because uh, Obama gave it to me. <laughs> Obama, this the Obama, Obama birth IUD. control. Yes, this the, oh, I know it's not, not going to happen. Uh, so, just and my breasts were getting sore. Uh, I used to get, I used to get heated at 5 a.m. every morning, right at work, but I thought it was the booth lights. Yeah, I was like, what's going on with these damn booth lights? Why the hell I'm getting hot every day and then it would just start from like the bottom of my feet all the way up to the top of my head and then it would go away and I I never thought it was that because I said I'm too young right. I'm too young I gotta be like 60 I thought you had to be 60 to get it you know what I mean I really did because <laughs> back in the day when I heard the white women talking about it they were yeah. old looking they, yeah. they weren't they weren't like Angela Bassett or Sherry mm -hmm. Rao they didn't look gorgeous you know they just looked old. So I was like, I, I don't look right. like that. So I know this can't be it. And so um, just emotionally, um, you go through all of these um, weird feelings that you have no idea why you're feeling this way. But I can say comedy and laughing is what saved me because I didn't like, I didn't have like rages or like, you know, get crazy because I found a way to make shit funny. Right. You know what I mean? So for me, comedy and, and finding ways to laugh at things allowed mm -hmm. me to not really feel 
the 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 full brunt of menopause. And like I said, when I did the commercial, I was like, shit, if I can go back and think about the stuff I went through, I was in fucking full blown menopause. But I didn't know the 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 five o'clock. It was every day at five a.m. Let and me tell still... you something. What I, I what I remember. I was a teenager when my mother was going through menopause. <laughs> and I tell everybody. Did she know? Did she, know? she knew. Okay. She knew because okay. she had the air conditioner on in the winter. Oh, okay. That is a telltale sign. She knew. Okay. And again, I'm going through puberty. So, you know, and, and as a guy, that's when, you know, we get used to all the things that we're going to deal with in the future. Right. And so now that she used to keep the air conditioner on in the winter, I can withstand cold temperatures. Wow. <laughs> thanks, wow. thanks to that. But <laughs> that was what she went through. But there's right. a, there, there, there's so many things now. Like I'm an advocate for medical marijuana. And the okay. thing is, a lot of people think it's just all about smoking. It's not all about smoking. It's not, you know, there are these things called tinctures. And what a tincture is, is it's an oil made mm -hmm. from the, the THC or the CBD and they have one for women who are going through menopause hmm. and they just take a drop, they put it under their tongue and it stops the symptoms. Like the really? hot flashes and the, yeah, stops it right away. Okay. But this I... is why I'm an advocate for it because yeah. there's so many helpful things that come from, that are derivative of the THC. It's not just about smoking, you know? It's not. I did a gummy, I did a two milligram gummy and I tell you, I was, fucked up and scared. I was like calling everybody. I don't know what's going on. Listen, I don't mess with the sleep. It was supposed to put me to sleep. Mm -hmm. It was two milligrams. Um, two milligrams of THC and CBD. And I, okay, so I had the CBD ones, right? Mm -hmm. And the CBD, put, but that THC did not put me to sleep after like three hours of me being up calling people to asking them, what do I do to bring myself down? Cause my heart was racing. I was scared. Uh, I fell out and I, the best sleep I've ever had, but I know I didn't feel <laughs> that again. See, I'm gonna give you my number. This, this is why you, you should call me up and I would have yeah. broke it down for you. Here's the thing though, with, with, with THC, they're, they're different types. Right. You have Indica and you have Sativa. Now, mm -hmm. Indica brings you down. So how it would you know you, in the gummy? It relaxes you. Well, they'll tell you, they should tell you on the wrapper which one it is because you have sativa, which is, all, sativa is the uplifting one. Like that's the one that makes right. people feel like they're paranoid. But mm -hmm. then you also have hybrids. So like a hybrid is a cross between the Indica and the sativa. It's kind of like right down the middle, but you have hybrids that range. So you'll have something that may be sativa dominant with a little bit of Indica. Or you'll have indica dominant with a little bit of sativa. I'm an uh, indica it was person. Supposed to be a sleepy time gummy. So because I'm always indica. hype, so I need to be brought down. Okay. So okay. I don't mess with the sativa. Like they literally, they have a strain of sativa called Green Crack. Exactly. But that's for people who are, you know, they're always, you know, they're low when they're, you know, low energy. Oh, uh, okay. To bring them up. Interesting. But yeah. I listen. I'll break it all down for you. I'm nervous because I used to, okay. I quit smoking marijuana in 86. Okay. I, I, I was 18, 17. Mm. Whatever it was, I know crack. They were putting crack in the in the weed, like the blunts. And, you know, they wanted to see how you act when you get it. Or they were trying to get with you. And so that happened to a couple of my girlfriends. And I said, I don't need to smoke no more. And I quit. I was like, y'all not going to get me like that. Yeah. And I, I was like, I there's too much shit I want to do. That I'm not. And I, at that age, I knew that I, I don't need that. I don't, because I didn't, after a while, the, it just, it, it got scary. And so I stopped. And um, uh, I used to go around my friends with posters, just say no, because Nancy Reagan, you know, mm -hmm. her campaign was just say no. So I'm still being comedian. But I just couldn't do it because I, I I didn't like that feeling of paranoia, if you will. Or I I felt like my intuition got sharper and like I could see people like their spirits. And I was like, yeah, and I was like, Ooh, I, I, can't, I can't I can't fuck with this because I didn't know how to explain it. 
You right. know what I mean? Because right. I was like, I can't, if I feel this way, I feel this energy from you, I should not be around you. And so that's that's why I was like, you know, I don't need to do let me let me stay with this. And I, and so, I think too, that's also what the the heavy I I think point of contention is with a lot of people is you know they grew up at that time and they remember you know how harmful and how hazardous crack was and they're like mm -hmm. now they want to legalize weed because a lot of people have you know lumped all drugs together yes of course drugs are drugs yes. but I I was telling someone recently you know there's this cream and Paula can vouch for this cream too I sent her this cream for her birthday it's a cream that you it's made out of it's, it's out of THC mm -hmm. okay and if you have any kind of like gout, stiff joints, arthritis, I used it when I had my appendix taken out. I had to, you, you know, I, I was sore. Mm -hmm. As soon as you put it on your skin, it hits those pain receptors and it stops the pain. Wow. It's a cream. And I don't know that. she'll tell you all about it. Like she can vouch wow. for it. That shit is, is amazing. But, wow. you know, but this is the other thing, going back to what we were talking about earlier. You know, I had some guests on a few shows back, I had uh, Tony, drum right, Antoine. Right, I was a, like, I know that name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had, <laughs> she's, a, she's a bedroom coach. She's a clinical right, certified they, sexual you know, I was coach. like, I know I see. Yeah, okay. yes, right. And I had right. on uh, my friend Deshaun, Deshaun Phoenix. Now, you, he's the one I told you about. He's a pole dancer, pole dance instructor. Oh, wow. And he's also an HIV activist. Listen, in New York, you got to have polarizing jobs. Yes, that's you true, just that's true. And so shout out to all the nurses dancer. who are stockbrokers, because there are nurses out there who are stockbrokers. That, wow. That's an inside joke. I'll tell you that later. I'll okay, tell you that so, later. But, but as a pole dancer, where does he do it at? Is it he, at he, 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 there's There are different uh, clubs that he dances at. There are uh, pole dance studios. I know House of Yes do something. They have he's some... at House of Yes. Yes, yeah, they go. All right, yes. so I definitely want to yeah, go yeah, here. Yeah. And he was just at, he had an event um, a while back called Shtickapole. That show, this is a comedy so you show. Know slash. Yes, so he, yes, yeah. So he was there for Prince wow. Night. I think that was back in February, but he was wow. there for Prince Night. Yes, so yeah, I, you I had no see. idea Chica Pole actually. Yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. But, but listen, his their job, Tony and Deshaun, what what you know what they do is they promote, you know, the healthy conversations about sex. That's what it's all about. Deshaun, yes. you know, is open. He he's out with you know his HIV status. He, you mm -hmm. know, he's an advocate. Yeah. And why do you think that there's such a large percentage of Black women, heterosexual Black women, over 50, living with HIV? Mm. Yes. Uh, because they let their guard down. Um, well, it all depends on when they got it, too. Because if they got it in their 20s, a lot of the down low brothers... You know, I feel a lot of the down low brothers transmuted it, transmitted it back to straight women. And they were unaware because my cousin, rest her soul, her partner did that to her. And I I didn't know at the time. But when I saw her, I was like, hey, she don't look right. What's going on with her? And so she knew and she didn't have the will to live. So she let it take her out. Whereas, you know, you can live with it. Like if you yeah. understand, you know, she could have whatever. So she passed away. He never told her. They were engaged in everything. He never told her. And the the last time he had a crisis, he wouldn't even let her. Like she, I don't know what the hell's going on with her where she wouldn't go to the hospital. He he forbade her to go into the hospital uh, to see him. And the mother, his mother um, was like, if you don't tell this girl what's going on with you, I'm going to tell her. So I think the mother finally told him what was going on. And that's when she could just let herself go. Mind you, she had two kids. That's why I was like, my, my, yeah. So it was it was crazy. That's like, and I had a cousin who was in prison. He was bisexual. And um, this was in the 80s. This was, um, yeah, the 80s. And he was actively giving it out. So when my dad died, no, this is the 90s. My dad died in 95. This is when he, so he's there. This is my cousin. And he looks horrible. He had the sores on his face and he's picking at his, I was like, yo, what the fuck are you doing? 
what's wrong with you? Right? I'm like, what's wrong with you? What you got? I said, you know, the rumor has it, you got the monster. He's like, well, I got art. I was like, what the fuck is art? Okay, yeah. AIDS-related complex. So he had the super bug, right? Because that's a super, that was the super bug. Mm -hmm. So he was out here giving it to women. Every woman that he messed with that we knew of uh, died. And then eventually he passed away like probably 97, 98. He's a good looking dude. You know, I don't, we don't know. He was doing heroin. He was doing some everything. Um, so we don't know. How, but so that is another reason I became chaste. Like I was like celibate. Like I don't have a problem being celibate, you right. know, because I'm, I want to live. Even with the prep and all that stuff. I was like, you know what? I fucked and I fucked a lot. And I know what it feels like. I'm good. I don't even fuck with the toys. <laughs> like, like I'm done. Like, and I don't know if that, that's probably fucking menopause, right? Because one of my friends, she was like, I don't even want to get involved with sex. I didn't even think about that. Because I was like, you know what? Like, if somebody's calling me, I'll get to them. But I was like, uh, oh shit, maybe that's a menopausal effect. Because I don't give a fuck. Like, I, I know what it's like. I, I've been there. I'm good. Right. But it's probably menopause that I think about it. But I've been so busy with comedy and working that I right. like that's the last if I'm not in a committed relationship, like I don't even like I just don't feel yeah. um men are as forthcoming. You know what happens to me a lot on Instagram? I get these good looking men. Not to say I can't pull a good looking man, mm -hmm. but these good looking men, right? They have seven pictures, right? Two of them are in military. Two were with their kids and two of them with no shirt on. I was like, I know you're a fucking scammer or bot. White, yep. black, it, it doesn't matter. Yep. I was like, so the first time I have, he said, hey, hey, beautiful. I was like, oh, shit. I said, don't do that. Don't do that. I said, so I just block them, block, 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 block. It's like, what, like, and so I have a girlfriend right now. Somebody told my business, but she's older than me. Okay older than me and she's just being stupid with this man has stupid. she given him money yet right so so i don't i don't she doesn't like she won't call me and yeah. tell me or so we have a mutual friend and the mutual friend is coming and telling me and i was like oh i gotta i said you know what i can't she's oh no we gotta call we gotta we gotta rally no she's too fucking old for me to rally around her and listen to her tell me bullshit yeah. Because she said he, he the guy said he needed fourteen hundred dollars right now, and but his money's in Jersey. But he, if, he, if she gives it to him right now, better. and so I said well, she she said well she said she didn't give it to him. I said well that's why she didn't call me because she gave it to him. Mm -hmm. She went. She's not gonna be able to lie to me and say she didn't give yeah, it to him because she know that you you are the one who will force accountability. Yes. Yes, it's like she's... the people who go on Dr. Phil. Like there, there was a woman on Dr. Phil years ago, but she thought in her mind that she was married to Tyler Perry. <sighs> listen to me, listen to me. I'm gonna, I, 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 I gotta tell you, listen to me, listen to me. So she has four kids, this woman. Good job. Black woman, she's a black woman. Worked, at, worked for the government down in, in, in Maryland, down in the DMV area, okay? Two of her kids she lost, lost custody of because of this whole back and forth with Tyler Perry, okay? So she thinks that, you know, he's asking her for money. She thinks that his baby that he had, she carried, even though she didn't carry the baby, but she thinks it's her child, okay? So her daughters are on Dr. Phil like, mom, you got to get your act together. Like, this is crazy. This is not Tyler Perry. You've been giving this man money and sending him money. He needed $5,000 to get his jet fixed. And Dr. Phil is telling her, "Jet, I have a jet and, and Tyler has a jet. We're neighbors. Jets cost more than that just to get somebody to come out to look at it to get fixed. This man is a scammer. You're being scammed. You're not talking to Tyler Perry. And so she says, well, I want Tyler to get off his high horse 
and I want him to get into divine order and I want him to acknowledge me because I've always treated him good and I've treated him like a deep south, dirty south, down south, New Orleans country boy. Yes. And her daughters are sitting there like, mom, you got to cut this out. But they're, they're still hurting. Good. Yeah. There's Omarion just was on Dr. Phil. The girl said she was married to him. That's that's what I just saw with Omarion. And Tommy from the Love and Hip Hop. Somebody did that to her just, just this month. It's mind blowing. There's no way you could, that's what I'm saying. I block him. I don't even, you can't. You you're got not going to gonna entertain. Yeah, yeah. You're you not have even going to. You have You're to. not going to get to know. What I get is these these finance people. I get a lot of these like oh, the forex, the forex, yeah, the trade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I they want to follow me, and and yeah, no. And then and then I get people who I actually do follow, and they jump in my inbox and they say, "Hi, I see you're following me. Would you like a reading?" And I have a friend, not going to mention that friend's name, who got scammed by one. Was it the ching, ching, ching in the money tree? Then they the need five more. Like, no. I no. I sent the guy money last year, right? The ching, ching, ching in the money tree. Every time it chings money comes to me. That shit was dope. I was like, Al. I said, you know what? Thank you, brother. Here's $20. You got to break that down. I never heard of that. Yeah, it's a it's a mantra, right? And okay. it's it's just like it just the, the rhythm of it everything it says what ching 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 goes the money tree every time it chings money comes to me okay front left right up and up under me money flows something something whatever so i was just saying okay. so I, I loved it i was like the rhythm the rhythm and so i sent the, i cashed after them 20 dollars mm -hmm. and so i was like hey i said i cashed after 20 dollars he's like oh sis i didn't get it Oh my God, that's not my account. You can send it here. Block. That's it. I blocked. I blocked. I said, you know what? Enjoy that twenty dollars. Blocked. I said, because not, it's not happening. And then he kept opening up other accounts to try to get me. Like, hey, so I was like, nah, get out of here. There's a new scam, and what they do is they send you like a crazy high amount of money, twenty five hundred, three thousand. 5,000 bucks mm -hmm. and you go into your cash app, you'll see that you got this money. So mm -hmm. knowing that you didn't ask anybody for it, some people, you know, they're sending the money back. But what happens when they send the money back is it debits their actual account. Holy shit. How the hell do they do that? Scammers. I know, but if they put it in your account, isn't that mm -hmm. money there or no? Yeah. Oh, it is there. It is. And they're telling people, when you see that money, just don't touch it or take it and deposit it into your own account or something like that. Okay, Whatever okay. you do, don't give it back. Oh, okay. There you go. The giving it back part is how they get you. Right. Okay. Okay. Exactly. I, oh, exactly. wow. It's and just so much. I would have never thought that the internet would just be so dangerous, that these apps would be so dangerous. That's the part that is like why I just try to like even though to do comedy you have to be out here right but you know you have to be wary of what's going on last night at the show the show is a great free show it's called it's called the laugh dance Saloon, right and so i'm a i'm a people person i'm networking so that these two guys showed up late i said yo y'all missed the whole comedy show yeah. he's like yeah i said i was i said it was good I said, y'all need to be at the next one. I said, matter of fact, what you do for a living uh, to the brother? Um, oh, the other guy was, I'm going to say Honduran. Mm -hmm. He looked black. He looked like a light-skinned right. black, but he wasn't. And then I said, I said, oh, shit. I said, but you you honorary black. And so the brother, I said, so what do you do? He said, oh, I do press releases. I'm like, I said, oh, give me your number because I need a press release, right, for my festival. Then I said to myself, that's not what a PR person would say, right? They don't say they do press releases. So when I said that, I said, oh, you know, I got my comedy festival coming up and I need help with my PR. Like, I need a PR, you know, specialist to help us get our shit out there. He said, oh, oh, you know, hit up my sister. So he gives me his sister's information. She responds. 
Miss Vaughn. She she's dope. She got like her following, uh, and the shit she's doing is dope. She's in Forbes magazine and stuff like that. So I'm happy making that connection, you know, because I gave a little spiel about what I need because I need help. I need help. Um, and I didn't know how to ask for help. Right. No, I, I'm not going to say it was pride, but I didn't know how to ask for help, you know, because if you look at what I do, it looks fucking amazing. I make this shit look amazing. And people think, oh, she make it look amazing. I know she got, she got it going on. No, I just know I need to make this shit look amazing. Because if I don't make it look amazing, who's going to show up? So I make the shit look amazing. But behind the scenes, we need help. We need help. We need volunteers to help with the stage managing each show. We need photographers. We need video. Like we need some of everybody um, and venues. Like right now, I'm waiting for a couple of comedy clubs to agree to the dates. Um, I do have some already, and I'm doing the scheduling. But yeah, like financially, sponsors would be great. You know what I'm saying? So those are things that I did not verbally say out loud. Because I didn't want, I'm like, uh, am I begging? You know what I mean? Like, how? But I was like, well, how? I don't want it to feel like I'm begging. But like you said earlier, this is something that's necessary for the culture of Black women in comedy. So I have to create the the language that makes somebody want to invest or make somebody want to help. Make somebody want to say, you know what? I like what she's doing. I believe in what she's doing. Let me see how I can get in here and help. You know, because... Uh, and that's what it's all about. Yes. I know how to produce the shit out of a show. I know how to make everything look good and make everybody look good. But it costs money. It costs money. And to pay these headliners, you know, um, I like I, I need to pay them, too. You know what I mean? Like They're doing this for the love of making sure they get paid. You know, that's the goal. Black women, just like any other person that's doing comedy, we need to be paid. We need to be on the same level of field as other people that's out here doing comedy. The women behind you in this picture, it's like all of them want to do stuff in comedy. They want to get to that level where they're a household name, right? So get the agents of the industry to come to these, these showcases in June and see these women, you know, and see what can be done to help them get to the next level because we could all eat. I'm building That's a table. Me. I'm building a table. This table's built. The table's built. Pull and up. there's plenty to go around. That's the it thing, is. too. It there's is. plenty it to is. go around. Like, I'm you're doing that. Mindset. I'm doing this here. Yes. You know, there's plenty to go around. It is. You know, and I, and I wouldn't be doing any of this if I didn't believe in it. Just like you wouldn't be doing what you're doing. Exactly. If you didn't believe in it. One of, one of the young ladies that participated in 2021 works on the Black Lady Sketch Show. Oh, I love I that. Think two, two of them, yes, two two of them did. Two of them are writers. And okay. Janelle James, I used to do shows with Janelle yes. James. I took Janelle James. And uh, Janelle James, for those of you who don't know, is Principal Ava on uh, oh, yeah. Abbott yeah, yeah. Elementary. <laughs> Abbott Elementary. Man, I didn't see that coming. You know, that show yeah. is so funny. I'm Such so proud show. of he got money. That's where I know Quinta from. He got, yeah. ooh, he got money. That shit. And like, shout out to Quinta. Person. That's my homegirl. Yes. Girl yes. Shout yes. out to her. Yes. yes. That was such a funny ass line. But, and you see how long she's been in the trenches. You know what I mean? So it's not, it's not an overnight um thing. You have to be out there and, and keep plugging away, plugging away um, at the, at the, um, at the task at hand, which you believe in. Um, just like um, Issa Rae, I remember hearing her say, oh, you don't have to try to level up and work with the people that's on your saying, like lateral, look your left, your right, say, how can we work together? So that's why I built this community to say, hey, how can we help each other get to the next level? And listen, you tell them women, they can come on my show anytime they want to. Oh, so Just so, like, right. you can come on anytime you want, but you tell them to come okay. on anytime, anytime, I will because put, it's I will all put about... Them. Right. It's, it's all about us sharing information. It's all about them sharing their information, me sharing mine. It's all about us just uplifting and yes. informing each other. That's not. Yes. But you know what? You know what? I have to tell you this, though. You know who you remind me of? You remind uh, me of there's a singer who I really, 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 really like. Her name is Lolita Holloway. And all right, yes. kids. 
Right yes, there. I saw her live. Did you really? Yes. That's um she's uh uh she's, uh a uh, love sensation. Love sensation. You said yes. Lolita. Lolita, Lolita Holloway. Oh, no, you Lolita said Holloway. Holloway. I thought you meant Lolita, Lolita Adams. Adams. No, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I like her too. Yeah, yeah, Lolita I was like Holloway. Um, okay. She sung Love Sensation and she also oh. sung Crash Goes Love. And here's the wild thing about Crash Goes Love. I have the, the record. I have the, the 12 inch of Crash Goes Love. Wait, hold on what, real quick. I'm going to show you. I'm giving everybody a treat because I'm very particular about my records. Ooh. <laughs> I have the, the 12 inch of Lolita Holloway. Crash okay, Goes I see it. I see it. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Wow. This is from the 80s. This is probably one of the first freestyle records that oh, was wow. ever made. And a black woman was the face of freestyle. Wow. Because most people know freestyle. They know like a lot of Latin acts doing freestyle. Right, but right, 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 right. It was Lolita Holloway and Joy Sims. And God rest, you know, God bless both of them. But you remind me of her in the sense that like y'all are bold women. I think Lolita was a hot, was was a, a Scorpio also, but y'all are bold, y'all still feminine and still ladylike. Thank you, thank you, and, thank and, you. All yes. right, kids. Now, now listen, kids. If you go on YouTube and you look up Lolita Holloway, L O L E A T T A, mm -hmm. there's a video of her performing "Love Sensation," and she gets down on the floor and she starts doing push-ups and humping the floor. Wow! In a okay, cocktail a dress. Yeah. Ah, right. yes. Okay. Wow. That's wow. In a cocktail wow. dress. All right. right. I remember that. I, I, I vaguely remember that because mm -hmm. the visual is crazy to yes. see that at that time. Yeah. So she was just being, she was just being different. She's just being her. Yeah. 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 And, and I, she's I, at, I a, at a gay club doing the first performance. I want to say it's a lesbian club. It was like 1984. And then in the second performance that's on YouTube, she's at a gay pride, I want to say back in maybe 2009. Hmm. But it was a very big, uh, uh, Love Sensation is a very big record. Yeah, yeah, very it big is. It is. Love Sensation. Yeah, Listen, exactly. I love house music. I love old school 80s house music. Yes. I think so how that's, yeah. I'm right up the alley today with this. And then okay. Crash Goes Love, is, is. it sounds like, how can I describe it? It sounds like a cross between IOU by Freeze, and um, if you know IOU by Freeze, yeah, yeah. and 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 um, I don't know, and and uh, it just it's a freestyle record. Okay, but okay. I got into a debate though with somebody, and and this is perfect for you because you're a comic, mm -hmm. you're a comedian, and it was that not all comics do stand up, and not all stand ups are comics. And then the argument was that like somebody could 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 possibly consider somebody like Will Smith a comedian, even though I don't know Will to have ever done stand up. Just like he Wendy tried. Williams did a stand up tour, even right. though she's not known to be a comedian. What no. do you think about that? Um, right now there is a a surge of a, a is it surge a surge of non comedians like rappers actors. Uh, not rap, uh, reality people uh, just throwing their uh, hat in the ring. Uh, um, I don't have a problem with it if they do the work. Get help with your writing because, you know, T.I. was doing it and T.I. Um, was riffing and some of it didn't hit. And he knew it. He was like, you know, whatever. So he's out there doing it. But I think now he got the rhythm of it because he, he, he stuck to it for like the year or the, whatever he was doing, the, the formula that he was using. So now that he's better, the goal of anyone that's attempting to do stand up is to stick with it. And if you're a celebrity, get help. And there's nothing wrong with getting writers. Chris Rock had writers to help him with his stuff. Um, so it's OK to get writers at that level or any level. It's okay right. to have like right now while you went to go get the the um the, album, the twelve inch uh huh twelve inch a friend of mine because we did the show in Boston and I did a joke and she's tagging me she said oh when you do that joke again this is how you could um act it out so she just texted that to me so there you know I don't have a problem with that like that's what you're supposed to do well that's a part of being a comedian uh, a stand up comedian. So the, the word is, is somebody a comic or a comedian? 
right? And right. to me, they're the same thing. They're the same okay. thing. To me, Dave Chappelle is a storyteller. Mm-hmm. He's a comedic Definitely. storyteller. Definitely. Definitely. He's never like set up punchline because that's the formula of typical stand-up. It's set up punchline, set up punchline. Um, premise, uh, the premise set up and then the punchline or set up premise punchline. So there's a formula. Boom, boom, boom. You get the the, the joke right away. Dave does like anecdotal, you know, draws a picture, takes you in, walks you through. Um, and I love that about him. I think that's a brilliant format of uh, his style. Um, right. Whereas someone like uh, Kevin Hart, he set a punchline, but he's starting to go into the storytelling. If you notice his, his later uh, acts, um, Cat Williams is a punchline heavy, heavy meaning. He does storytelling, but he makes sure the jokes like come quick because sometimes with Dave you gotta sit and listen at his wisdom and his mm-hmm. yeah. you know acting in like he's gonna let you know how smart he is. Whereas you I like you said your own right, punchline from that. Right. And it's like with mm-hmm. with me, I just like being silly. I just like get it out there. Hey, right. I'm goofy and I'm funny and you're gonna get these jokes. Well what's your writing process like then? Uh, uh it's very, very um hard for me to write. I have trouble writing. I write on stage. I will just get on stage and like we're talking now or I might remember a piece and I'll fucking say, okay, this is how I want it to go on stage. And that is part of the improv uh, training I've had that I trust myself enough to say I can be funny anywhere, anytime, anyplace. And that was one of the um, 12 steps. And so the structure of stand-up, the pure structure of stand-up is a set list. Okay. You go from set, you know, if you got A, A to E, whatever, but you that's how you enter. So if you ever buy a a, a live album or something from you see they got the breakdown of what the topics are about and they weave it together. I am disjointed. I just go with the flow. I'm just like, wherever it takes me, I do that. And I have, um, sometimes I'll beat myself up and say, Joe, why don't you just do the structure? Mm-hmm. Do the structure. So people, you know, boom, boom, boom. But I, when I get up there. But it's, do you realize that that disjointedness is your structure? There you go. Exactly. Because I See? know what I'm doing. I was like, I... Your consistency is being inconsistent. There you go. Wow. And you know what's fucked up? Not that fucked up. But this guy, the guy that brought me into comedy, told me about comedy, mm-hmm. We when we was dating, like, he was never consistent. Right? Okay. But he was inconsistent. He was consistent at being inconsistent. Yes. yes. And that was a pattern. And his inconsistency was consistent right and so that's why so when i brought it to his t- his attention he laughed he said oh you're catching on and i said i was like well, this is a game i was like oh so this is i said that's not what i want in a relationship i don't want to be figuring out stuff i don't want to be wondering but but now I, you, you went to school for psychology though no, at that that's time. That's all about figuring stuff out. I know, but that at that time I wasn't. So that's probably what made me do it more so. Right. Because I right. I need to understand stuff and yeah. why this why this. And then I got to understand he was afraid, you know, he was afraid of love. That was Andre's issue. He was afraid of love. He he got hurt. Um he got sent to group home. His mother couldn't handle him. And I believe he told me the story, but he made it seem like it was someone else. But he got got uh, abused as a little boy. And so, you know, and so the trauma, like, so when I meet men, right, uh, well, in my early 30s or whatever, the first thing I would say, have you ever slept with a man? Like, I, That's I, need, to know that. I need to know that. And I, there's no shaming. Right. Because that's you. That's what you want to do. But I need to know. Like, I need to know if we're going to pursue a relationship, what's your proclivity? Like, what do you what do you want to do? 
Like, so I'll know how I need to behave because I've, I've never done that. I've never, not that, I should say that. I've never dated someone that was bisexual or fluid. And I just okay. wanted to understand emotionally, what would that look like if right. I had the opportunity to be in a relationship with someone and accepting of that? I've always wanted to be able to say, all right, I'll fuck with you. Okay. Right. All right. I know this about you. All right. So let's do, do we discuss it? Like, I don't like really need to discuss it with you, but if you, cause, cause the thing that we hear is mm -hmm. if that's what you, if you like both sexes, that means I'm going to worry about you cheating or you're going to be out there doing other stuff. But see, that's what you mentioned earlier. That's ego. Yes. Yes. That's it ego. is. It is. So right. I'm at the age where I know, all right, let me respectfully, let's talk about what it is you want to do and how we could formulate a relationship. Because, you know, people talk about poly, uh, is it polyamorous? Listen, I have a whole show on that. Oh, yeah. You did it already? With, with, yeah, you'll see it. It's, it's, okay, um, okay. it's up now. Um, okay. With, uh, the show with Tony uh, Drumright Antoine. Okay. Okay, and okay. we talk about that. We touch on that because it's the whole okay. polygamy, polyamory. Oh, okay, good. I need to understand what that is. Yeah. yeah. There's, a, there's is, an Instagram that I follow. It, and I'm dying. like, what is going on? I was like, let me, I unfollow because it was, it was just, everything was sex. I was like, mm, okay. I, I can't, yeah, see, I can't. that's the thing with me and Instagram because for some reason, I get like all these, I like food. I like to see food on my Instagram. So I follow America's Test mm -hmm. Kitchen, Cook's okay. Country. I follow certain chefs because it, there's just something about seeing food that yeah. is just pleasing to me. Mm -hmm. But no, what does Instagram put in my search? Sexy, shirtless, you know, niggas in speedos. I'm following anybody like this. So why y'all got this on my explore that, page? That, are you talking about that? Because, you know, they listen oh. and they be... Oh. Suggesting shit in in your phone. None like, of that. Wow. And then I had to go through who I'm following. I'm like, am I following anybody oh. that's always naked? And I'm and then I thought about it. I'm like, okay, well, I do have one friend who is kind of naked all the time. So maybe that's why. Interesting. I didn't know that. I but the rest of my stuff them. is food. I like to see food. I like to see stuff stuff you know pertaining to my frat. I like to see black women. I like mm. to see black history. I like to see stuff like that. You right, know? right, right, right. I like to see hip hop, you know, those things. But for some reason, I've been getting all the thirst traps. Wow, that's interesting. And what is like, what is Instagram trying to say? I don't know what they're trying to say. And I don't know if they're listening or what. I don't know what's yeah. going on. Like, I thought I shut everything off in here so that they couldn't listen. <laughs> right, yeah, because it's tricky. It it's very yeah. tricky how, how uh, like, you know, the... What is it called? Shaper. It's in, and it was an all in one, you know, one of those um, things women wear to keep your a shit in. Uh, Spanx or body Yeah, shaper. Spanx. It's one of the body shapers, right? So okay. I um, was talking about it. And then next thing you know, I get on Facebook, the ad pops up. You had an ad. It's yeah. like, yo, that, it freaked me because out. Because those apps listen. Yeah. They listen to everything we say and everything That's we do. I mean, up. an ad That's blocker is up. the best thing that you can invest in. Honestly. Oh, yeah? I have ad blockers like galore. Like I don't get any ads when I'm surfing. <laughs> when I'm on the web, I don't get any ads. Oh, but yeah, okay. ad blocker is probably the best thing that you can invest in because it just it keeps all of that stuff away. Right. It blocks right. all of that crazy crap out. Tell us about the uh, the Laugh Fest that you'd have founded, the Black Women in Comedy Laugh Fest. Yes. That, that picture of those beautiful women over there. Yes. Those beautiful women right there. Yes, it's just, tell it's, us about that. I want to know all about the Black Women in Comedy Laugh Fest. Um, the festival was created. Um, our mission statement says the festival was born out of rage. Um, where is she? She's in here. Where she, oh, she's behind me. I can't see. Yeah, that lady what, right there. Her name shirt? is Shauna, right here with the short hair. The, right, that's Mimi Simpson. I don't know if you can see. Okay. Spell. Oh wait, wait. Where's my hand? I don't go to your, go to the opposite direction. Okay, so yeah, the one right here with the smile in the middle. Yes. Uh, uh, okay, the light skin. Okay, that's the yes. blue shirt. The one with the uh -huh. white t-shirt and the denim jacket. That's Shauna yes. Christmas. She and I were talking in a Facebook group one night. Uh, she brought to our attention. Um, it's all all funny comedians. 
she brought it to our attention that there was a festival happening in New York City and there were no black women in the festival. So she was like, yo, New York, what the hell is going on up there? How you don't have no black women in here? Da, da, da. So I work nights, I peep it, and I'm like, oh, so I read the article and I'm like, this is strange. And I remember doing the festival. So I was like, well, I was on it last year. So what's going on this year? So everybody's chiming in that are up and see it. So someone tagged the festival director, the creator. Right. Um, but as that, she did, she was asleep, I guess. But in the process of us talking about it, I was like, you know, I'm trying to fuck that. Let's create our own. I said that. Yeah. And so that was October 2018. I went to GoDaddy, snatched up Black Women in Comedy Laugh Fest. I went to uh, Instagram. I just snatched it all up. And then I I, well, I sent it uh, to Sean. I said, boom. She said, oh, shit, you serious? I said, because I didn't know her. We just met through the internet, that, that right. topic. I said, yeah, that's, that's kind of who I am. When I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. And so... And I said, oh, I'm going to do it during Black History Month. She said, what? Nobody does. We, this, this, is Octo this is October. I was like, uh, so? Like, because I, I ain't know shit about a festival. I just knew Black History Month was the best time to do it. Um, nobody's going to fuck with us. Um, we're going to have the protection of our, our ancestors. And um, yeah, we get done. So then... When I started seeing like, oh, I opened submissions, women submitted, it was $10. I didn't know shit. You know, it shouldn't have been $10, first of all. Um, but I didn't know what I was doing, but I, I wanted to be I wanted it to be affordable. So that was the number one key because one of the things you hear about festivals, oh, it's so expensive. So I made it $10, didn't realize submission fees would pay for shit, right? So I didn't I didn't know that part. Um, so um at that year it was just the first um it was only three venues at the time. Anyway, these women that came to this festival just exploded with love, community, a sisterhood, a level of trust. As you can see from the smile, these are genuine smiles because they didn't know what to expect. But what they got was like, oh, this, I didn't know I was missing this. This is what I was missing. I was missing my sisters. And so that gave me the, um, the, the strength to say, oh, I'm going to do it again. We're not. This is going to be done again and again and again. And of course, COVID happened. Um, but the festival let me know that my sisters in comedy need a space for themselves to show up, be present, be seen. I mean, our first year, one of the ladies got on laugh tracks. There was an industry in the audience and she was on laugh tracks that season. Um, her name was Coco, um, Coco Fresh. And uh, uh, a few yeah, of the others got JFL auditions. Yes, they, they got JFL auditions, you know, so people... You know, it's like, oh, oh, how come? Like, and I know the industry's like, oh shit, this is a great way to see black women all in one place. But why, why didn't we fucking think of this? You know, because y'all weren't thinking of us. So I provide, I'm providing an opportunity for black women to be seen by industry, and for us to have support, for us to have an opportunity to network and bond, and just continue to build an infrastructure that in comedy that. It exists, but the women to me that are at that level, you know, not I, I'm not saying I don't know them where they reaching back. You know what I'm saying? I want I want to be able to reach up and reach back and and encompass everyone so that we're all elevating. Um there's no always oh, just us, it's just me kind of I can be the only one in the room. No, it's all of us gonna show up. We all showing up. And we're gonna show up rooting for you, right? Like with the the Abbott, Abbott Elementary, like mm -hmm. that's a, a like it's it's beyond belief how they're uh, coveting her and 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 giving her all the accolades because what she created, just like Issa Rae, it's like what they're creating in their own in their own lane is giving us 
uh, uh, Shonda Rhimes, like all these black women that are in the forefront of media and entertainment are doing the damn thing. And so yes. comedy is like, I'm, I'm trying to get into that, that stratosphere of how can we keep elevating all these dope women? Because a lot of these women, they, they got lighting packets. You know what I mean? They want to do sketch. They want to do all the things. So I want to provide a platform where they get those tools. And we're still growing. Um, this year, we should have more industry um, attending, you know, because they like it's not a fly by night. This was not a one and done. You know, I'm curating something that I know has legs and getting the support, getting the sponsorship, getting, you know, the right people to invest in what we're doing will take it to the next level, take it to the a whole next level of, of uh, you know, more industry, more opportunities at these clubs. I don't have to be waiting to get a date. You know, it's like, oh, this is a short thing here. Here's your dates. You know what I mean? Uh, so I this is my fourth year and it's like, I'm struggling a little bit to get locked in with some of these dates. Yes, it's March. The festival's in June. I need to lock in dates now right? because I need to start doing my schedule. So some of the clubs are, are waiting. I don't know what for. So I'm looking for other venues in the meantime, you know, because. And that's what you got to do. Yeah. I just like that's keep it moving. I'm not it. sitting and waiting. I, I just, that's, that's something right. that I've never, um, you're not, nobody's going to stop this train <laughs> that's going forward. The laugh train. Because that's what Greg Mocker, he's a, a WPIX Channel I 11. I love Greg Mocker. Yes. yes. He's covered me and a couple of times. And my mother loves Greg Mocker. Yes. He's a sweet Mr. G. She is yes. obsessed with Mr. G. Every he's... time my mother comes to visit me, where's Mr. G? <laughs> and Greg so Mocker. Greg... So yeah, shout Greg out has... to the two of them. Yes. Yes. that institution so last year um he interviewed us for the festival mm. and then you know he's like that's what i'm going to call again for this year um but we definitely need a pr package we need like like i said i make it look good but guys listen it's a lot of work and um having an administrative team that are not comedians will be great uh because i don't like i would I don't want to take away from the comedians that want to perform, you know, because I'm a performer, but when it comes to the festival, I'm all hands on. I'm not out there performing while the festival is happening. And listen, if anyone is out, out there watching and listening, because I know you all watch and listen, <laughs> um, hit Joanna up. I'm going to leave all her info up so you guys can reach out to her. And, you know, if you have that administrative spirit, reach out to her. If you have that PR spirit, reach out to her and also y'all better get those tickets yes because <laughs> Support i tell people is everything. every show i tell them every show joanna every time somebody's on when people come on my show the price goes up there you go ow so, i love it i love it i love it y'all better jump on that i'm gonna put all yes. the info down there and you know and i love that you know you, you're doing this for these women because i mean you're on several boards because you're on yes. that let me let me wait let me think because I, I memorized Stand Up Girls NYC is one. Yes. Gold Comedy Advisory Board yes. is another. Um, Ladies of Comedy Association yes. Talent Board yes. is the yeah. other one, I think. Was I? Okay. Yeah, those, okay. Are, those are the top three. Yes. So tell us yes. about the mentoring that you do yes. for those aspiring comedians. Um. <sighs> It's something that when I look back at my beginning stages, I didn't have a mentor, right? And and I know that if I did, I probably wouldn't be here talking to you right now, right? Um, just having someone guiding and sharing the 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 how to become a better comic, how to become a better business comedian, because it's about the business economy um, when you're out here doing stand up. And just having the the opportunity to talk to these younger comics, um, and and allow you know hearing their perspective, telling them to go for it, tell them don't hold back because that's what I did. I was very timid. I know I loved comedy, but I was timid, and so that's why I took the Meisner to help free myself and and come out of my shell. Um, but yes, knowing 
uh, that these young girls are, are coming up, these young women are coming up, that their voices matter, right? So whatever it is that you want to talk about, the topics you want to talk about, what's, what's close to you, just share it because it's the only you, it's your perspective, um, you know, and people want to hear what you have to say, especially if there's joy in your delivery and the way you feel and you know, I I feel like I exude love, I exude joy. And so when I get on stage, I'm like, look, guys, y'all won't believe what I be going through. And just like talking matter of factly about situations and scenarios. Yes. So mentoring, I just try to help build their confidence and let them know whatever you say is the right thing. There's never anything wrong what you say on stage. Finding the funny is a natural thing that will come in time. So trying to be funny off the bat, because I wasn't, but learning and figuring out where the funny is, what makes things funny and what's funny about you, what's funny about your life, what can you share? Because I, I, I'd rather share than sell. That's another tip from the 12 step. Because a lot of times comics get up there and they're selling you these jokes and they're not hitting because you're not sharing from a place of love. You're just like in a, a, a like a, a salesman. Like, oh, you, oh, these jokes are funny. Oh, oh, laugh at my jokes. No, I want you to feel what I'm saying. I want you to know that I care enough about you that I'm going to give you a, a show. I'm going to give you material about me. Um, I remember when I met uh, John DeResta. John DeResta is an actor, but he was also a transit cop. And he created a one-man show called The Subway Cops Beat. And I was like, oh my God, man. I was like, you know, because at the time I was not talking about working for MTA. I did not, I did not know how to talk about my job as a token before. So I got a chance to meet him. He gave me his email. Um, and I emailed him. And I was like, hi, you know, I met you. And I'm a token book clerk. I said, how do you talk? How, how do I? I go about talking about. He was like, "What? A token book clerk?" He said, "You're the you're the only token book clerk, so you can talk about it because you're the only token book clerk." So then I started getting on stage talking about, you know what? Yeah, I work. For, I used to get on with my uniform, and I was like, you know what? Fuck all y'all. Y'all need to read the signs. Like I was really going ham on the passenger until yeah. someone pulled me to the side. It's like you know, they pay you. They pay you. They said pay you. I said, so you, they said, you need to not get on stage. First of all, the union was like, you can't perform in your uniform. I said, all right. So I stopped doing that. But I stopped being mean-spirited about the job or the audience or the public. Like, oh, y'all can't read. And I was like, oh, shit, there's a lot of people that can't read. You know what I mean? Like, people can't read. They could be grown-ups, but they can't read. So I was like, ooh, I got to be sensitive to that. Like, I'm thinking it's funny, but shit. Somebody may not, and they could call up and say, oh, this bitch just told me I need to read the sign. I can't read. Or somebody <laughs> will say, <laughs> somebody right. will say, um, miss, could you tell me how much is on my card? And they'll swipe it. And I was like, well, you see what it says? I can't see. I'm like, I'm, I'm looking at you. You ain't got no glasses on. What do you mean you can't see? So being sensitive to those uh, differences or the uh, people's capabilities had me tone down how I talk about the job. So I would say something like, man, I love when the fare was $2. I said, you know how fast I was? Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. You were getting all your shit quick. I said, when they went to two twenty five, you know how long it took me? I had to like peek and get the calculator. I had to, I couldn't get y'all to see me calculate because I was like, two twenty five times ten. Okay, how much is that? You know, I said, that's why the lines are long. I said, it wasn't nothing else. We couldn't count. You know, so I would like start doing like that kind of, I guess, self-deprecating or just talking about it from every everybody's perspective. That so that it's like nope. So then transit, you know, they did a, a story on me. So transit knows I do can't comedy, and they they like where I'm at now with it because you know I make fun of everybody. Like I I don't bash. And you know what I what I what I really love about what you said about the mentoring and everything is that you're giving with a warm hand. Someone who's also from Brooklyn 
said that very, very long time ago. Judge Judy actually said, okay. it's better to give with mm -hmm. one hand. Right. And that's I something like that. that, you know, something that I do in life too, is just, if I'm going to give you something, I'm going to give it to you with a warm hand. I don't want anything yes. back. There you go. There you go. Because I But know. I want you to take this and enjoy this and use this to your advantage. Okay, so one of the things, like, I don't have any children, right? And mm -hmm. these women, and I had an open mic that was dope. It was called WCW, Wednesday's Comedy Workout, at the club I managed. And all of those comics were, like, my babies, right? They called me Mama Joe. Some of the comics called me Mama Joe. Some called me Auntie Joe. Um, but I gave them love, right? Because mm, just say this, stand-up is... There's a lot of people that are damaged, right? Or, or have trauma and stand up is that source where they can get uh, some relief from it. So I knew that, I know that I, I got a degree. So I know, so I handled with a warm hand all of the comics that came in contact with me because I know love is the, the, the force that will uh, open people up and, and have them drop their guard a little bit and know that they have a safe space. So that's what I, I love creating. And so to get a comedian from, say, five years ago, say, or see me, or, and it's like, you know, your open mic was the best open mic. I learned so much about that. Da, da, da. That makes me feel good. That makes me feel good. There's a young lady. Is she in this picture? I believe she's in this picture. She just moved to New York. I just saw that she was here. I said, oh, when you, you, you're visiting? She said, oh, no, I just moved here. And so I was like, oh, that's good to know. I said, so now I got another source to pull from um, as far as booking and stuff like that. And it's and also so the, LGB2 inclus inclusive. LGBT inclusive. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Listen, they started okay. saying it was the gay festival. And so I was like, oh, I, I, I can't. I don't know how to tell. You know what I'm saying? Right. I don't right, know how to right. tell. You know what I'm saying? So I was yeah. like, oh. Oh, okay. I didn't know. Well, whatever. Everybody welcome. We had one trans woman okay. submit. She didn't get selected. She didn't get selected. Okay. But I was like, oh, I'm so because okay. I am no longer allowed to look at the videos. Cause I'm like, Oprah, you get in, you get in, you get in. Okay. Everybody okay. get in. So cause I right. am that person. I see potential. But for mm -hmm. a festival, you can't have people with potential. You gotta have people yeah. that are gonna be able to deliver. Um, so it's like, nah, you you, you let everybody in. You, you, you don't have the space. So I had to like right now. I I selected we not well. We selected thirty one women plus mm -hmm. the five headliners and then six features. Right. So overall total is about fifty women. Next year I have to cut that in half. I have to cut it unless I get help. Like if I can get help right. to do all of this, I can do it. But I need help because technically I need seven venues every night to get, okay. to get you know what I mean? Seven yeah. women on each stage, right? Because last year I was trying to, get, like my goal was like, I want them to get on stage. So I was getting them two shows a night. And then the, the feedback I got was like, we didn't have no downtown. We didn't have no downtown. I was like, y'all want it downtown or not stage time? I was like, all right, okay. Because mm -hmm. I know the times I've done festivals. Yeah. I got one show. I'm traveling hundreds of miles and I only got one show? Nah. Nah, so I wouldn't come to New York. Y'all better help Joanna. I'm, I'm, I'm telling y'all. Y'all better help this lady Thank out. Thank you. And I have Thank to do this. I have to commend you. I have to commend you and give you your flowers for what you're doing. I don't like Thank to say you. giving flowers because everybody says that. Right, but I really right. mean that. I have to commend you for doing that because, you know, it's better to share knowledge than to hoard knowledge. Yes, I agree. And that is the I true agree. foundation of a transformational relationship. Oh, and I say this shit all the time. I say the people who fuck with you, fuck with you. Regardless, you don't have to do anything in return. You don't need a certain amount of engagement. You don't need any of that trivial nonsense. So, and, 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 so I thank you because again, you came on my show, Sight Unseen, by some people. But I'll just say this, the calls are coming in for something good. I'm opening myself up to that. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and when they all see it, don't hit me up like, oh, I want to come on. Let me come on. I just got your message, my schedule free. No, 
What did I tell y'all earlier on the show? Yes. I hold yeah. grudges. And I, but I actually give motherfuckers. Petty grudge. Respect. Uh, but wait a minute, Joanna. I give motherfuckers the respect of saying no. There you go. I, I, I'm yes. going to tell you no. Right, right. I'm right. not going to say, oh, let me check my schedule. Or, oh, I just got right, to right, right. no. I'm going to tell you no. There but you, you know what? I had my I had my flex moment. I dropped all my flex bombs, Joanna. I'm gonna open <laughs> myself up to the blessings, the Zen energy, the Wu Sa, the Wu Sa, yes, the Wu Sa, the Wu Sa, the affirmation. Listen, I'm gonna play when I get done with you. I'm gonna play my record. I'm gonna plug the record player in. But I want you to let everybody know though. How can they get in touch with you? How can everybody get in touch with you? Um, if they want right. to come to a show, they want to book you, they want to oh, help you out. Bookings? Yes, well, help me out. If you go to our Instagram page, it's the Black Women in Comedy Laugh Fest. It's B-W-I-C-L-A-F-F-F-E-S-T. That's Instagram. Uh, my personal is Joanna M, as in Mary, Briley, my full name. One word on Instagram, that's my personal page. My middle name is Maria. Is I like that. Emma's okay. in the media. Um, yes. And um, right. The, if you want to help with the festival, DM me, um, whatever, PR, graphic designing, because I got like 25 shows. I'm I'm up on Canva trying to figure out how to put this move over here. Because um, it's graphic designing is expensive as well. It is. It's like, it you is. know, so I, I'm i not trying until we could abundance, abundance mindset. We're going to have, we're going to manifest the money. We're going to manifest the people to be in place to make this the festival that it, it's supposed to be. We're going to manifest the interns, the interns to come and help. Especially communication. Students. Right. In, 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 Fish uh, communication. School of NYU. I know you're watching. Wow. Right. Because I'm I'm saying if, if, if I can get them some kind of credit uh, for being an intern, um, I would do it to help with their grades or whatever, to help with the social media, um, yes. graphic design. Because there are people who do that for free all day. And so all I day. need to find those people because I don't, yes. you know, and so I, and it's also too, like you said, opening yourself up, being vulnerable to say, I need help. And that is yes. something then, because as black women, we're always like the strong black women. Oh, don't worry about it. I got it. Don't worry about it. I got it. No, I ain't got it. I ain't got it. I ain't got it. This but is but the strength goes back to what I talked about earlier with that having to put on the brave face. Yes. And it's okay yes. to be sensitive. It's okay yeah. to yeah. be, you know, in that position of needing help. But once yeah. again, so that's Joanna M. Briley, all one word on Instagram. And so it's you, it's Joanna as in a cool and a gang record. Yes. Right. Or dog ball. Joe, Joe, Joanna. Yes, yes, yes. Why not? Why not? Why not? All yes, right. yes. Also, yes. Amazon Money, Briley, B R I L E Y. All one word on IG. And also, you guys need to follow that Black Women in Comedy Laugh Fest. That's B as in Black, W as in Women, I as in N, C as in Comedy, L A F F Fest. That's yes, also amen. all one word on IG. Yes. Now make is. sure, now I'm going to tell everybody, Joanna, because this is what I do. I, I get on them. Make sure you have three Fs. If you have two Fs, you'll be on the wrong page. <laughs> exactly. Right? right. You're having it's a good time with yes. Miss Joanna. Don't make me go there this week. <laughs> You're right. It is. It is. All right. And I just, um, as part of the Black Woman in Comedy Left Fest, one of my shows is Joke Sisters. Joke Sisters was a great show created during the festival that I am now taking on tour, a mini tour okay. to different cities. Um, uh, just, you know, just to see what the legs look like, see what it looks like, um, if we could draw the numbers, um, because sometimes it's something that um, you just have to do and see what happens. Yes. And that's what I've been doing. And um, it is... I'm keeping the abundance mindset. Like I'm, I'm not going to go for the lag, but it's, it's about learning the ropes because no one's teaching us. I had went to a workshop a networking and there was a touring agent and she was saying, if you are not making a million dollars on the road, they're not looking at you. You know what I mean? So if you're a touring, if you're a comedian and you're doing those numbers, yeah, you're going to get an agent. 
a touring agent that's going to help you get even bigger tours. Um, but what, what I'm doing is just getting my feet wet, just to see what it looked like. You know, get and myself. Love what you do. This is yes, this is what I enjoy and what I can see in you is that you love doing it. You have so much fun doing yes. it, and that's the important thing. Is that like I have fun doing this? Like yes. we've been on here damn near like the whole morning, but I I'm having fun. Yes, I've had fun the whole morning with you, and I'm so glad you came on. But let me ask you this: I gotta ask you this. What's the wildest thing that you've seen while you were on stage and you were up there performing? Um, I'm, is, is it a, oh, uh, this, these two drunk people, right? I mean, uh -huh. they were in a relationship. Okay. They, they want, they got up and started arguing in the middle of the show. And she, she was trying to diss him. He was trying to diss her. Talking about she don't know how to suck dick, you know, and they were old. They weren't young people. They were like in their fifties. I shouldn't say old, but you know, they were older people right. that should know better. They weren't spring chickens. Right. And they it's like, wait a minute, y'all shouldn't be talking, you know, they shouldn't be talking like this in a comedy club. So of course the comics, I had a field day, you know, and I was like, whose mom and daddy is this? You know, like what is going on? What what were y'all drinking? Most of the time it's brown liquor. You know, that's why I stick to tequila and brown liquor be having everybody just acting up. And that's the worst thing. Right. That's the as a comedian, that's the worst thing you could could happen to you is to lose the audience, to lose the audience to a heckler or disruptive audience members. That is the most. It's not a good feeling because either you got to get security involved if you get a club with security or just like hope they leave. Like I don't engage in the negative part of heckling. Like, you know, I'll do the banter back and forth or what I call crowd work. I do it in such a way where it's lovingly done. There's no hatred. There's no, I'm going to get this guy. Oh, look at your shirt. No, I don't find that to be funny. It's more insulting because people, and that's why you'll see people won't sit in the front row because they know comics pick on them. And that, I would say, I want to say that's a black thing. I don't know if that's an urban thing, but D.L. Hughley was good at that at, in comic view. They, you know, urban comedy, that's what they do. The, uh, Robin Harris, you know, looking like a test tube baby. Like everything was about ranking on us, you know, the audience. And I love sitting in front. Oh, I sat in the front. Oh, me I too. love it. I love it. Listen, yeah. make a joke. Make make me your joke. That's yeah. what I'm here for. I want to laugh. Yeah. And so I, I, I always, listen, right. one time I went to a show and my girlfriend was like, no, I'm not sitting in the front with you. So we sat in the back. Right, but I had on, I had on, I had on a dope ass vest. Right, this was the eighties, no, the nineties. I had on a vest. It was black and white, right? Mm -hmm. But you know those lights that are like blue and they make your shirt light up. Yeah, like your shirt yeah. iridescent or whatever. So the mm -hmm. host was like, "Wait a minute, who the fuck got on aluminum foil in the back?" <laughs> and my girlfriend looked at me. I said, "Look, it don't matter where the fuck I sit." Don't matter where I sit, I get chosen. Yeah. He's picked on, and I thought that was the funniest shit. But your spirit resonated with his. He knew to fuck with you, and not nobody else, because he knew that you would be okay with. It. And so, when you say that, it's like when I try to like replay scenarios in my life. That's what it is. It's synchronicity. Yes. It's spirit. It's a that's alignment. flow. Yes. Right. Oh, there you go. Right. There you go. Flow. It's flow. That's it's flow. flow. And yeah. so I am aware of it. And then like I get caught up in the 3D and I forget. Right. And so now just planting and listening to my affirmations and my subliminals and stuff like that to keep myself in alignment is where I'm at right now. So I say um, early, like when I say, you know, uh, I am so thankful and grateful for all the sponsors that will be helping out with the festival. I am so thankful and grateful for all the um, volunteers that are going to be coming to assist us. I'm so thankful and grateful for all the sold out shows for this festival and, and for the future festival. Because, you know, you gotta act as if, right? You gotta see the end. It. And exactly. it's success, it's success, it's success. I love that you say that because you have, you said that and I have one that sits here on my desk. And it says, I want my life organized, easy, and abundant. 
Wow. There you go. And that's all I want. I want it organized, easy, and abundant. I think that I deserve to have that. I like to ask for my guests, if you had a time machine, what would you go back and tell yourself in the past? Oh, don't suck that dick. No, I'm scared. <laughs> don't suck that dick. No, not that one. Don't do that one. Okay, don't suck that dick. Not his dick. Nah, nah, no. No. Um, what I would tell myself is don't hold your parents responsible for stuff that they did not know. Because I am much more aware that my mother didn't know and my dad didn't know. And if they don't know, it's not because they they weren't taught, right? So they were, uh, my great, my grandmother was a chef. I was on uh, picking cotton and my great grandmother, they were chef. So they just knew survival. So I'm the generation that got the knowledge went to college and understands to break the generational curse. So I was able to forgive my mom. I was able to forgive my dad and to, you know, give them grace and say, you know what? They didn't know. They didn't know. So when I deal with the public, like in that mindset, it's like, okay, they don't know. Like, you know, people, it's like, you have to want the breakthrough, right? You got to want the breakthrough to heal. Is it shadow work? You have to want to get to that level of, I'm tired of repeating this damn cycle. How do I get out of it? Do the work. Do the work. Forgive the people. You don't forget, but you forgive the people so you can move on and get to the next. So I would tell Joanna, um, AKA Piggy, because that was my nickname. <laughs> I would tell her, do not... Um, Hold your parents. Um, don't be angry at the decision they've made. Your mom made the right decision to send you to live with your dad. Your dad did the best he could. He wasn't a communicator, so he didn't know how to say, hey, me and your mom, your mom told me to come get you. That He, he made it seem like I got to talk. I just asked your dad to take you for the summer. I didn't tell him to keep you. I was like, oh, I didn't know that. So I got, of course, I got mad at my dad when I found that out. So it's like, all you have to do is open your mouth and say, hey, this is the situation that's going on. You know, this is where you're going to be for now, blah, blah, blah. But I feel like that shaped me, got me into the comedy. So that is what I had to deal with. And that helps me because my one woman show, I, it's called Swipe This, My Life in Transit, but it's about transitioning in each phase of life and being trapped in the booth, right? When I worked Christopher Street, the people that I saw, the trans people, I just wanted to be out there with them. The freedom, there was freedom that I saw every night of them partying, dressing the way they wanted to dress and just, hey girl, whatever. And I was like, that's what I want. I want to be free. I want to be free out of this booth. I come, I put myself in a box, literally and figuratively, and I need to get out of here. So, the, well, people see my show. It's beautiful. I have, uh, I play Diana Ross's I'm Coming Out and I do a, a act out of me coming out of the booth. Um, and freeing myself because I did confine myself to a box. And that's the gist of the, the story. And so, yeah, Joanna, you're going to be all right. You're going to be all right. You're going to be dope. And I knew it. Like, it's like, hmm. and maybe I knew I was different. Hindsight is 2020. It is. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I'm I'm glad for all the experiences I've had. I don't regret anything other than sucking that dick. I'm just gonna ah, this is, ah, this is sucking that dick. <laughs> so much wisdom, I tell you, from you to this this evening, this afternoon, this morning. What Thank what you. Are, what do you have coming up though? March 27th, I'll be at the new Grizzly Pair Midtown, which is on West 45th. 
no, West 54th Street, um, right across from Iguanas. If you ever hung out in Iguanas, love uh, Iguanas. Okay, and shout out I to won't... Paula again because yes. me and her used to be up in there, drunk <laughs> and guacamole like two crazy people. Yes, so yeah, the I love pair, that. I have that. That's uh. In uh, Midtown, Club. right? Yeah, Midtown, right. Okay. So I'm going to be there Monday. It's a Monday night, Monday, March 27th, 8 p.m., all female lineup, Joke Sisters, back in New York City. Um, and I'm so excited. My homegirl, Janelle Jackson, is headlining. She's from Comedy Era, and she's old school, OG comedian, along with Peaches Rodriguez, um, who's also another OG. And it's just like a, a love affair to women, um, in, in the comedy game and just a platform for them to shine. And I have some newbies, uh, some uh, comedians that are like a year in the game, but I'm also like, I open the door for everybody to come and have opportunities. But these newbies are funny as fuck too. You know what I mean? So I don't just be throwing anybody up, but they're funny, they're talented, and the show is going to be dope. If you have a birthday, come celebrate your birthday. That's another way I get people to right. come out. All you Aries, come on out. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you Aries. But March, um, April 1st, I'm going to be in Long Island um, okay. at the v VFW, um, something VFW, well, Peaches again. Peaches booked okay. me for this show. Um, but yes, the festival really is the, the next project, June 14th through the 18th in New York City at various clubs. So as, he, as you so kindly asked people to hit me up, um, if you want to email me, you can email me at Black Women in Comedy Laugh Fest uh, at gmail.com. That's B W I C L A F F F E S T at gmail.com. Um, it's just, you know, it's very overwhelming, but um, I'm open to people helping. I'm, I'm going to receive, I'm going to allow the universe to um, bless us with um, the support that we need to keep this going. Because it's amazing. It's amazing. It's so amazing. And you that. also have coming up, um, you have an event in Philly coming up. Oh, oops. I forgot all about Philly. And shout Philly. out to South Philly. South Philly, yes. Yes. Um, a young lady, her name is Tanya Morgan. She's okay. Philly and she's a sketch, improv, and stand up comedy teacher. She purchased a building on East Pastion Avenue. Pashon. Mm -hmm. Pashon. Oh, that's how you say it? Yeah, passion. Okay. Uh -huh. she, so yeah. she she purchased the property and she's turning it into a comedy improv sketch um, center for the community. She wants to teach teens and kids um, stand up and sketch. And she wants the community to be able to use the space for events. And uh, so we're helping her with the grand opening uh, April 7th. Uh, Friday, April 7th at 7 p.m. I'm hosting. And then Saturday, April 8th, my girl Chandra Jan Daniels is hosting. Uh, and the space is called Sal Saw You Bunk. No. Sawabona Sal Sal uh -huh. Creativity Project. That's the name of the venue. Um, it's a, a South African name that means, I forgot what it meant. It, it has a special meaning. Well, and listen. When I have her on, because I'd like to have her on, so okay. let's see if we could get that going. Okay, okay I'll definitely. We can, we can shout. find out. Yes, there you go. What it means. That's amazing. Shout out yes. to her. And I just literally, I was just texting my mother because that's like that's right around the corner from my mother. That is house. amazing. And I'm like, mom, you, we, I'm gonna come down and we gotta go to the show. <laughs> wow, that is so amazing. That's <laughs> right. And that's how small distance. the world. Right. Yeah. That's the small world that we live yeah. in um, that I love when this happens, because that means we're in flow. Yes. Flow. Get you using it. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Yes. That's, yes. A, that's a comic right there. That's a, that's yes. a comedian right there. Yes, and, we're in the and listen, flow. Um, shout out to all the SEPTA workers, too, because SEPTA is the MTA of Philly. Yes. Yes, it is. So shout yes, out to is. all of them. Yes. You know, yes. make sure you, you all, you know, Come out, come out to the show. Yes, come out and support. I'm the not one funny that. sister yes, and the other funny, funny sister. sisters. Yes, it's a whole uh, Philly, I call it the Philly, fun, the funny Philly sisters because it's a lot. Um, myself and Holly and Chandra are the only New Yorkers coming down. Everybody else is okay. from Philly. So oh, that's nice. what I love, like I said, with the show, being able to tap into the network 
of all the funny women in each city is a beautiful thing. I want it to be uh, a, an opportunity to showcase them. Because most of the time when you see a tour, it's the same people in every city, the same right. comedians. And I was like, I want to do it different. I want to invite, because I, I feel like I'm coming to your hometown. And then you have another one coming up too in April. Um, Virginia. Virginia, right? Yes. Where, in, where in Virginia News. is that one? That's going to oh, be a Kazi's Comedy Club in Newport News, Virginia. It's the it's on a Sunday night. It's one of the oldest comedy clubs in Virginia, and so we are going to be there at seven o'clock with Donna Lewis headlining, and the women are also women that were in the festival. So that's I just love that nice. it's full circle that the women that were in the festival also are part of Joke Sisters. So wherever I go. I have a joke sister with me. I have a couple. Yeah, of shout out to all the joke sisters. I love a good joke sister. Let me tell you yes, something. Yes, I yes. I love me a good joke sister. And 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 shout out to Virginia to VA two up two down. Yes, that's yes. gonna be that. Those are uh, Newport News. Let me think that a lot of uh, military people in that town. Yes. So, Ooh, I might like, give me somebody. All right. Listen, all right. you might could. You Go might could. military people. Go to the base. Let me, let me tell you, like <laughs> I tell, like I tell anybody whenever I have a woman on my show. If you're going to slide into those DMs, be respectful. There you go. I appreciate that, too. That's all blockity, I'm going to say. Yeah, blockity, block, block. Because you don't want this crazy light-skinned nigga coming after you. Thank you. I appreciate it because it is, you know, hopefully that will happen. If you, Because, you know, I, for me as a single woman, sometimes like a man will hear I do stand up and they get intimidated. You know what I mean? They feel, they feel you know, some kind of way. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to be me. If you don't, if you can't understand that what I'm right. doing is suit of happiness for me, then, you know, keep doing what you're doing. And that's not the one for you anyway. Exactly. You I'm know. understanding that now. I'm understanding no, that now. That's not the one. But I like that. Listen, you you are truly one funny sister. Like, thank for real. You. For you. Thank you. Thank and you. And I want you to come back. Listen, come back I do. again and again and again and again and again. Y'all better support this black woman shows, thank you, okay? Thank you, support thank her you. shows. Let everyone you know, um, let everyone know, every, everyone you know know that she has right. these shows. It's like tell a friend and so on and so yes. on and so on. And like, listen, I'm going to have to make Paula take off work so we can come to a show. All right? Yes, Paula. And I want you to tell everybody um, one more time how they can get in touch with you. You can reach me on Instagram. I think, it's, well, Instagram is the best way. I'm on Facebook too, but Instagram is instant, right? So right. Joanna M, as in Maria, as in money, Briley on Instagram or the Black Women in Comedy Laugh Fest page as well. Or Joke Sisters, which whichever one is easy for you to spell out. Joke Sisters, but Sisters is spelled S-I-S-T-A-S, not E-R-S. It's sisters, okay? Sisters, it's black. Sisters, yes, it's black and black, black. Like they're not yeah. nuns telling jokes, okay? Exactly. <laughs> All right. Although we will be PG in um uh, uh in Philly at the request of the owner of the venue, so we respectfully okay. Okay. are are gonna uh, oblige her. Um, so yeah, yeah uh, Joanna Briley. Joanna M. Briley on Instagram. If you go to Facebook, it's Joanna Briley. I really don't accept on Facebook. You gotta like, you gotta tell me. Matter of fact, if you do hit me up, you gotta talk about something I said in here. So I know you saw the show and that I'll accept you because yeah. There you go. There you I'm, go. I'm and there. then also add me because yes. that's how we know that you watch the show. Exactly. There you go. So there don't be go. jumping into Joanna's DMs and you didn't watch the show. There you and go. don't be jumping into my DMs and you didn't buy your tickets. There you go. Amen. That's what I'm talking about. Support, support, support. And I feel right. you've made me feel good about saying I needed help. Like Thank I you. didn't, like it felt like uh, I'm someplace Thank safe, you. safe space. Yes. You know, and this is a safe space. I want everybody out there to know, yes. like, you know, I, I'm, I'm a little rowdy. You know, I, you know, I carry on a little bit. But this is a very safe space. This yes. is a safe space. This is an inclusive space. I want everybody to feel like they yes. can come here right. and talk about whatever it is they need to talk about. And we can have a good exchange and we can have a fair exchange. But Joanna, thank right. you for sacrificing thank your bedtime you. for my yes. foolishness. Yes. I'm going to be all right because I'm going to go to work tonight and I'm going to do all the things. And then I get home early tomorrow. Well, yeah. listen, I'm going to put all that up. 
And okay. I want to thank everybody out there. I want to thank all of you for listening and watching. Thank Listen, you. tell your friends, tell your mama, tell your daddy, tell your baby daddy, tell your boyfriend, tell your sister, tell your cat, tell your dog, tell your doctor. Tell yes. Billy Crystal. Tell <laughs> Janelle yes. James. Yes. Tell Quinta. Listen, yes. tell, tell all these great yes. people. Yes. Tell everybody yes. downtown in, in, in Brooklyn. Tell everybody in Connecticut. Listen, to follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Chris David TV. And follow our show at The Chris David Show on Instagram and YouTube. You can also visit chrisdavidshow.com. There you'll find the links to all the great things I mentioned. And remember, that's Chris with the C, no H, and David like Dave Chappelle. Or David Venable on QVC, another Scorpio. <laughs> now, now, listen, y'all take care and laugh, motherfucker. Yes, laugh, motherfucker. Do. I love it. That's a and y'all be well. Be well. Thank you.